All right, guys. That was some great stuff. Uh, Shabbat Shalom, by the way, again, for the second time tonight. Shabbat Shalom from Under the Dome, Hebrews and Shebrews. We, of course, are moving on. We're going to be going through the Genesis Targum. We're on Chapter 9. And, of course, Chapter 9 is loaded. Uh, Michael was absolutely correct. He emailed me or sent me a message for this week and told me that. And it was like, just, wow, the stuff we're going to be covering tonight is some heavy, it's a very heavy topic. And it's one of those things that is not made known in Christianity if you've grown up and always wondered what the sin of Ham was. And uh, I'll tell you, just like uh, with the Adam and Hava story, it straight out lays it out. And I'm not going to give it away now. We'll read it in a few minutes. I will say that uh, I ho hope everyone had a good Sabbath today. And I was telling the group before we started that I have my my precious little baby daughter. And she's, you know, she's not really newborn anymore. She's six weeks old and she's starting to kind of mature. Her face is definitely mature. And she's starting to, um, you know, like follow you across the room and just stare at you. And um, she's kind of trying to reach and grab for things. And and she was down on the, the the carpet on the rug today, making the most adorable gurgling sounds. And she, for the first time, uh, like discovered a, we have this uh, stuffed animal that I bought for her before she was born. And we didn't know if she was going to be a boy or girl. And it's, we could not decide for the longest time whether this is a, uh, a raccoon, a squirrel, a cat, a dog, or a fox. It's, it's kind of like they're making toys now to be like, gender whatever you know whatever they identify neutral uh animals whatever i think it's a i kind of think it looks like a squirrel my wife thinks it's a fox but anyways for the first time today she reached you know her hands out and started touching it and kind of knocking it over and and like she was just obsessed with it and it was the most adorable thing ever so i'm like i could be studying right now for tonight or i could be watching the most beautiful adorable little baby uh play on the rug and uh so <laughs> we'll see how this i'm just giving everyone a warning that uh the baby was on my mind today and uh but i'm excited to be here and go through the targum with you guys and i think it'll be a really good study nonetheless so what i'm going to do is i'm going to read from chapter nine usually i have michael read i'm just going to go ahead and read it tonight and then i'll give michael the first commentary and let him dig into it and introduce himself. I'm always very excited uh, that Michael is here, and he puts in a lot of work. I know every single week on these studies, and uh, he brings up points that I'd never thought of before, and I'm always uh, very encouraged by that, and very rarely do we steal each other's thunder or trample on each other. I think we had a little bit of that last week, and undoubtedly we will this week, because it, it, it's pretty straightforward, but here we go. Chapter 9 of the Genesis Targum. I'm, of course, reading from the Targum of Jonathan. And Yahuwah blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Spread forth and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and on every fowl of the heavens, of all that the earth swarmeth forth and all the fishes of the sea, and to your hand are they delivered. Every morning, every moving thing which liveth to you shall be for food. As the green herb have I given to you the whole. But flesh, which is torn of the living beast, what time the life is in it, or that torn from a slaughtered animal before all the breath has gone forth, you shall not eat. But the blood of your lives I will require of every animal which hath killed a man. I will require that it be put to death on his account. And from the hand of the human being, from the hand of the man who hath shed the blood of his brother, will I require the life of a man. Whoso sheddeth the blood of man, the judges by witnesses shall condemn him unto death. But he who sheddeth it without witnesses, Yahuwah of the world will bring punishment on him in the day of the great judgment, because in the image of Yahuwah he made man. And you, spread yourselves abroad and multiply. Bring forth in the earth and increase in it. And Yahuwah spake to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your children after you. 
and with every living soul that is with you, of birds and of cattle and of every beast of the earth that is with you, of all that go forth from the ark, of every beast of the earth, and while I will establish my covenant with you and will not again cause all flesh to perish by the waters of a flood, and there shall not again be a flood to destroy the earth. And Yahuwah said, This is the sign of the covenant which I establish between my word and between you and every living soul that is with you until the generations of the world. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of the covenant between my word and the earth. And it shall be that when I spread forth my glorious cloud over the earth, the bow shall be seen in the daytime while the sun is not sunk or hidden in a cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between my word and between you and every living soul of all flesh, that there shall not be the waters of a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between the word of Yahuwah and every living soul of all flesh that is upon the earth. And Yahuwah said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have covenanted between my word and between the word for all flesh that is upon the earth. And the sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, or Yapheth, and, uh, and Cham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and from them they were spread abroad to dwell in all the earth. And Noah began to be a man working in the earth, and he found a vine, which the river had brought away from the Garden of Eden, and he planted it in a vineyard, and it flourished in a day. And its grapes became ripe, and he pressed them out, and he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he made himself naked in the midst of his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, beheld the nakedness of his father and showed it to his brethren without. And Shem and Yapheth took a mantle and bare it upon the shoulders of each and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were turned back and the nakedness of their father they did not behold. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew by the relation of a dream what had been done to him by Ham his son, who was inferior in worth on the account that he had begotten a fourth son. And he said, Accursed is Canaan, who is his fourth son. A serving servant shall he be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be Yahuwah, the Elohim of Shem, whose work is righteous, and therefore shall Canaan be servant unto him. Yahuwah shall beautif beautify the borders of Yapheth, and his sons shall be proselyted and dwell in the schools of Shem, and Canaan shall be a servant to them. And Noah lived after the deluge 350 years. And all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Thus concludes Genesis chapter 9 of the Aramaic Targum. I'm handing it over to Michael. All right, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. I had a busy week. Something new that happened this week for me was um, my, my Shabbat group, you know, they do the typical study, fellowship, food, music. But then at the very end, they do a 30-minute teaching. Um, someone gives a 30 minute teaching and this week was my was was my turn and I am not a public speaker I don't know how I even do this but maybe because you're not looking at me but um so yeah I was mentally drained studying for that all week as well in addition to this so like Noel said we have a lot of good stuff to get into and let's go um I will start at number one <clears throat> and let me post my first comment here okay, so Noah blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And um, as you can see, word study time, um, that word multiply is used five times in Genesis. And we've already read all of them, right? Um, nothing, there's only one, it's only used one other time past this time. So Genesis 1, you have, you know, the creation of the whole heavens and earth. Genesis 9, you have the flood and the new creation after the flood. The only other time it's used and this, this was really good. I, I, Jeremiah 29, thus says the Lord of hosts, Yah of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses, live in them, plant gardens, eat their produce, take wives and become the fathers of sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands, that they may, may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to Yahuwah on its behalf for its welfare you have. Welfare. 
And so it's, it kind of blew me away and hit me. Um, I would always say, you know, uh, <clears throat> this, the be fruitful and multiply were for reset events. And, and up until this study, you know, I never even noticed this Jeremiah one. And this is showing us how we are supposed to live in exile in Babylon. And it was just like, boom, okay. Um, we are supposed to live there, take wives, become sons and daughters, um, bear sons, multiply there, do not decrease. That's a specific command in the prophets. And I thought that was awesome. Um, so yeah, uh, second word study on replenish. And so again, it's not used that much. So it's used in Genesis 1, so the same. So Genesis 1.22, fill the waters. So be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters. Genesis 1.28, fill the earth. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Okay, Ezekiel 43. So it's also used this time as well. So for seven days, you should prepare a daily goat for a sin offering. Also a young bull and a ram from, from the flock without blemish shall be prepared. For seven days, they shall make atonement for the altar and purify it, so that they consecrate or cleanse the altar or consecrate it. When they have completed the days, it shall be on the eighth day and onward. The priest shall offer your burnt offerings on the altar and peace, and your peace offerings, and I will accept you, declares the Lord God. So three out of the four verses, Genesis 122, Genesis 128, Genesis 9, 1, the word means fulfill or replenish. But then in Ezekiel, it means consecrate the altar. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, cleansing the altar. Same with filling the waters, fill, replenishing. Um, I'll do one more and hand off to Noel. Number two, it says, uh, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea into your hand are they to be delivered. Um, another word today, so that, that word, the fear of, and the fear of you. So he was given Noah, you know, they will all look upon him in fear. All that move upon the earth, all the fishes of the sea, um, they'll still have that dread. Um, so Deuteronomy 11, starting at 22, for if you are careful to keep all this commandment, which I am commanding you today, key, to love the Lord your God, walk in all his ways, and hold fast to him, then you will drive out all these nations from before you, and you will dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. Every place in which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. Your border will be from the wilderness to Lebanon and from the river, the river Euphrates, as far as the Western Sea. Now here's the key. No man will be able to stand before you. The, that Yahuwah, your, your Elohim, will lay the dread of you and the fear of you on all the land on which you set foot that he has spoken with you. So... Again, after the flood, the fear the animals are talking about um, and the fowl of the air, that uh, they will have fear of you. And then in Deuteronomy, the same word is used. When we are obeying his commands, no man will be able to stand before you. Um, they will have fear of you on all the land on which you set your foot. What do you guys think about that? I thought that was cool. Um, switching from the animals to, um, to the man. And I'm, I'm assuming it's not scared fear. But... Uh, I don't know. What do you guys think about that? I I have a lot, but I'll hand off to Noel. All right. Well, I dropped a chart in here, and Josh, I don't know if you can pick this up. And I always found this really fascinating. And years ago, I would look at charts like this, and I would find them very unsettling. Because I would, I would ask questions like, how is it that for all of human history, we don't have a population growth until about 1800 and then boom it just explodes it just it just skyrockets look at that it just it like it's like uh i mean nasa can't even shoot up shuttles like that uh, straight up and you know to the sky it always arches back over right well now here we see um starting in it's oh man this one let me get to one other chart where you can see it a little bit better and this one is more specific to the year 1800. And you see here that uh, China and India just really, uh, <laughs> like if, if the command is that we're to uh, populate the earth, then uh, China and India are fulfilling their end of the bargain uh, or their end of the uh, commands. Uh, but you could see, of course, the United States and all the others, and it's really an ex a, 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 explosion that happens after 1800 it's closer to 1850 and all of a sudden it just takes off it's like well, what was happening um so we go from 
what is it about 200 million people to um uh, really way beyond below that but now it's upwards of you know the billions right so I, I really, when I look at the world around us right now, and I, I'll just go ahead and say it for the study. I think most people here are, you know, understand exactly what this means is, is we have a mud flood event. We have a reset events where there are very few people on the earth. And then within just a very short span of time, less than 200 years, really 160 years, the earth explodes with population. And so think about that now in Adam and Eve's day, but then also in Noah's day. Now, with Noah and his family, it's a little bit different because it was just one family. And in the 1800s, we had we still had more than one family. There was, you know, people all across the earth. But in the following chapters, when we're going into chapter 10 versus uh, chapter 11, we're getting into the uh, Tower of Babel events, and then we're going to get into the uh, the Genesis War between um, uh, Nimrod and uh, with the the kings of Canaan and King Og and all that. Uh, we're going to, I think we're seeing something very, very similar. In fact, when I look around at the world uh, with all that's happening with, you know, CERN, and I don't need to go into all of that. You guys know what I'm talking about. I feel like we are in Genesis 9 through, uh, you know, 11, 12, 13, all over again. I feel like the world is a very similar place to be. Um, so I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. And uh, let's see, what do we have here in, that was, of course, the first one. I don't need to repeat that again. I guess I'm on verse two. And if I was trying to listen, if um, if Michael already stated this, I apologize. But there's a there's an interesting contrast between Genesis 9-2 and Genesis 1-28. Or, yeah. And here's what it says. Again, I'll repeat verse two. It says, and the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. Uh, and and on every fowl of the heavens, of all that the earth swarmeth forth, and all the fish of the sea into your hands they are delivered. Well, here's what Genesis one twenty eight says. Now keep in mind, this is uh, this is when man man and woman are created. This is not necessarily Adam. We went through that in the early studies. If you believe this is Adam and Eve, that's totally cool. Uh, I'm not going to argue that. Um, but you know, the, the idea might be that this is just man in general. And Genesis one twenty eight, this is the end of the original creation week. And he blessed them, and Yahuwah said to them, Increase and multiply, and fill the earth with sons and daughters, and prevail over it in, in its possessions. And, but here's what I want to focus on. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the heavens, and over every creeping animal that creepeth upon the ground. Now, the command to rule over the animals is different from the original version. Instead of merely commanding Noah to subdue the earth, Elohim tells Noah... Uh, and company that the animals will fear them. He doesn't say that in Genesis one. Mankind was never given that piece of information uh, prior. So some interpret this to mean that prior to the flood, animals did not fear man. Others suggest that this simply reinforces the hostile, difficult nature of survival in the post world flood, which I kind of think both may be true. Contextually, we see in a few verses that animals who don't fear man will be put to death. That in turn, uh, you, you can think about like um, like the movie Jaws. The plot line was uh, a, a big shark comes and it eats a, a boy. And so they have to go hunt the shark and they actually catch the wrong shark. And, you know, you guys all know the plot. Or you can think of like a, a bear in the woods goes and mauls someone. They have to go out and they have to kill it afterwards. So in a way that this the 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 Gentiles at Goyim are actually if they're doing this, they're actually keeping to what you who had commanded. Um, so that in turn will create more fear in other animals. If the other if the other animals are saying, "Oh, dude, anyone who comes up goes up against the humans are getting knocked off," kind of causes them to, uh, you know, kind of run away from us. But then, uh, but then also look at how humanity has dominated nature today. So we see that, um, you know, I'm here in the Charleston region, it, the the low country of the Carolinas is beautiful with all the the uh, the swamps and the grass and the the um, the grand oak trees with the, you know, the Spanish moss hanging down. It's just, it's gloriously beautiful. Um, but in the several years that we have lived here, we have seen houses go up just indiscriminately everywhere, just buildings, everything, just destroying the land. And it's, it's, it's tragically sad. And we're seeing the animals, you know, they have a fear of man. 
uh, that that seems to be, you know, it's kind of like a no dub. That seems to be what he's stating here, that there is a uh, that the animals would fear the total dominance that man would have when they come off the ark. Um, and. All right, I'm going to leave the next section up to Michael to take it next, because I think this is really controversial. And also, I want to see what he has to say about it, because uh, this is actually I think that there's like two really controversial things in this chapter and uh, that people really argue about on all sides. And uh, I think we're about to hit it. So, Michael, back to you. <laughs> so I'll let uh, you know. Tomatoes might... and stones. I might not be as controversial as you think. <laughs> um, so, so I, I want to say you're talking about number three. So I don't have much. Um, I could have gone a huge rabbit hole, like you were, you were saying, but I did not. So um, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb. I've given you all these things. Now, I don't necessarily agree with this, but I found a commentary that said it, that the notice is given that meat from animals can now be used for food in the same way that green pan plants were given previously. This does not necessarily mean that people had not eaten meat up to this point, but only that now the killing of animals for food was divinely permitted. What do you guys think about that? Um, I, yeah, I don't know. My, 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 I don't know, but before I elaborate more, uh, Stephanie found this, the Septuagint, it's very interesting, this, this passage. It says, and every reptile which is living shall be to you for meat. I've given all things to you as the green herbs. <laughs> every reptile. It literally says that. What do you guys think about that? I, I'm kind of tongue twisted here. I don't even know where to begin. Um, maybe I can comment on what Noel says. <laughs> but uh, my, my guess was they were eating meat before before this. Um if you know the law was always there and all that the sacrifices and all that um number five it says but the blood of your lives will i require of every animal which hath killed a man i will i will require that it to be put to death on his account and from the hand of the human being from the hand of the man who hath shed the blood of his brother will i require the life of the man um okay so another commentary this is more of a midrash Take that with a grain of salt, um, but I'm going to open it up and ask for questions here. Because they say, and surely your blood of your lives will I require. So that part, the very first part. To support the proposition that one who commits suicide is considered an evildoer of the highest degree. They taught that the Jews should not carry out for one who committed suicide anything to honor that person. But the Jews should bury the body after cleansing and dressing it in a shroud. What do you guys think about that? Suicide, that's an interesting um, topic within this community. What do you guys think about that? My, uh, if I just had to take a guess, my I would still say it's a hard issue. I don't know. I, I, I don't see anything that directly says if they do. Um, but, but yeah, obviously you're in a bad place. Um, I'll stop at six. I got one more and I'll stop at six. Um, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of Yah made, made he man. Palestinian says, Who sheddeth the blood of man, look how different it is, the judges by witnesses shall condemn him unto death. But he who sheddeth it without witnesses, the Lord of the world will bring punishment on him in a day of great judgment. Because in the image of the Lord he made man. Um, <laughs> uh, so more midrash commentary again I'm, I'm trying to find different views from different people christians uh early first century um, just to kind of give you what their thought process is all they say on this one is um they taught that upon rising in the morning one should wash one's face in honor of one's creator as genesis 9 6 says from the image of yah made he man so that's what they say on that okay so the infamous Noahide laws. I, I wanted to put it here. Um, what do you guys make about that? So the rabbis inter in interpreted Genesis 9 to set forth seven Noahide laws binding on all people. So to set up courts of justice, not to commit adultery, not to commit blasphemy, not to commit sexual immorality, not to, not to commit bloodshed, not to commit robbery, not to eat flesh cut from a living animal. 
Um, again, I, this is more, in my opinion, rabbinic stuff because I don't see that reading Genesis 9. I see a few. I don't see all those. I think they're adding into the text per se. Um, Jubilees, so they, they say, you know, during my research on this, they, the book of Jubilees, some people say this is talking about the Noah High Laws. So Jubilees chapter 7, 20 through 25. In the 28th Jubilee, Noah began to enjoin upon his sons, sons the ordinances and the commandments and all the judgments that he knew. And he exhorted his sons to observe righteousness and to cover the shame of their flesh and to bless their creator and honor father and mother and love their neighbor and guard their souls from fornication and uncleanness and all iniquity. For owing to these three things came upon the flood upon the earth. For whoso sheddeth man's blood and whoso eateth the blood of any flesh shall be destroyed. So again, some people say that this is talking about it. Again, I don't really see it. Um, what do you guys think about this? To me, it seems like a stretch, primarily rabbinic, but I thought this was a good place to enter in the know-how law discussion. And you guys really see that cracking down on us or anything like that. Um, take notes, and when we open it up, love to hear it. I'll hand it off to Nona. I uh, know how laws. So I remember when I came over to the Torah uh, a few years back, the hot topic amongst truthers at the time was the Noahide laws, which, you know, the Zionists are going to apparently enforce upon the whole world. And I, I think it had to do at the time with like Trump being King Cyrus or whatever. And, you know, that it was like, you know, the, the Zionist uh, enforcement of the Noahide laws was supposed to happen at any moment. And I don't want to put my foot in my mouth here, but well, okay, so one of the accusations that people would throw my way is that, oh, no, he's he's obeying the Torah now. He's he's yeah. going to fall for the, for the Antichrist. When the Antichrist shows up, he's going to he's going to help enforce the Noahide laws. And I'm just like, you guys are crazy. Like, this is, that, what does Noahide laws have to do with the Torah? Like, whatever. But the thing is, and this is where I'm going to put my foot in my mouth, is that when you actually, when you, the so-called Noahide laws, if the, as, as Michael said, if these really truly exist, um, it's like, uh, don't murder, don't commit adultery, uh, don't eat the flesh off living animals. Like you, you have a problem with that. Like you, you, you want people to murder. Like, I, I don't know. I, I feel like that's a, this is coming from Yahuwah. Yuh keep in mind, he's saying like, don't do these things. That, that seems pretty good to me. Now, the only thing that, you know, they will, you'll get on is the no hide laws is the blasphemy because, you know, it's true that if, if the Zionists who, you know, they, they, by the way, you know, I believe Zionist, Zionism is just a pet project of uh, the Roman Catholic Church. But uh, if the Zionists were to enforce a Noahide law on the on the world, um, I could see where blasphemy could be. Uh, if you declare Yahusha to be Messiah, that could be blasphemy against uh, the Most High. I, I could see, you know, that angle. But that's just my two cents on. I'm going to throw that out there. And uh, okay, so Genesis three, and this is the. This is the, the hotly debated verse. I mean, this comes up a lot. Uh, Genesis 9.3 is used to show that all animals are on the menu. Gorilla, kitten, puppy, you name it. Apparently, according to the LXX, reptiles as well. I didn't good catch, uh, Michael, or, or was it Stephanie? That's a good catch. I don't know. Maybe that's, <laughs> maybe that's where the dinosaurs went extinct. They cooked them up and ate them all. Uh, actually, if you read the book of King Og... Uh, I mentioned this book a lot because it really is a fascinating read. It, it, it's a fascinating glimpse into the ancient world. He talks about these dragon herds. He calls them giant lizards, uh, he, and that they would that they ran around the earth. These giant lizards, and he would hunt and eat them. So maybe there you go. Maybe they really did eat them up and cook them up. Um, but most people, however, when asked, don't know there were seven pairs of clean animals on the ark, totaling 14 in all. We went over that last week and the week before that, and that comes mainly from Genesis 7-1, but there's another reference in the Targum where it mentions that as well. Uh, most people think there were two pairs of all animals, no qualifiers, because that's what they were taught growing up in Sunday school and big church. I was too. I was taught that. And so I would read Genesis repeatedly and I never saw it. I would just skim right over. I never put it together. Wait, wait, there's clean animals. And there were, there were 14 of them. It, so anyways, yeah. So regardless, the passage is, is still hotly debated um, even among the rabbis today. And so what I find fascinating here is the Targum's 
total silence on the issue. Uh, seriously, like this is one of those things when I was reading the Targum for the first time, and it's just blowing my mind on all the things it's expounding on or you know talking about. Total silence here. Just they didn't even like, you know, they they had. If you if this if the point of this is to just create some sort of system that didn't exist, you think that they would totally throw that in right here. And by the way, you know, you know, however this plays out. And there's nothing here about clean or unclean where I would expect there to be. Verses five through six are very Torah centric and in line with what uh, we see there, uh, putting an animal down to death that has killed a man, um, like a, like if an ox scores somebody, that sort of thing. Uh, no killing other humans nor consuming any creature with its life still in it, which is the blood. I, for one, don't believe Noah would have eaten unclean animals. Many are inclined to conclude that Elohim is putting all food on the menu for humanity in general. Uh, again, the LXX does make a good case with all reptiles, but but that he is making a set-apart nation which is to adhere to cleanliness. I wouldn't have a problem with that, except that Psalm 82 implies that even the surrounding nations were supposed to be taught the Torah. Again, Christians love this verse because they use it to justify their lifestyle. Uh, they're just keeping to the Noahide laws. Dun dun dun. But I find it to be one of the most conflicting verses in the whole scripture, as it really it is really rather vague. And by the way, it does not line up with the popular uh, mouse and swine flesh passage in Isaiah chapter sixty six, which reads, "They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh, uh, and the abomination and the mouse." Shall be consumed together, says Yahuwah. They're actually be consumed with fire. So, at his um, at his return, um, you know, when he's coming to make all things right, uh, he's got an issue with people eating swine flesh. He's got an issue with uh, uh, people um, eating the mouse. Those are both unclean animals. So it is what it is. Now, one of the one of the things I did kind of read in the rabbinical. Uh, comments and again people reading this like they don't even know what to make of this um and so i'd be curious to get your guys' point of view they'll talk about how that uh i, I don't really agree with this but some of the rabbis will say that the, the morality was at such a low point that you know it's like who was just lowering his bar of stand his standards and i don't i don't think he ever lowers his standards um and uh, particularly if if you had just one family, it's not like there's thousands of people coming into the new earth. It's just one family coming off a boat. And he's like, uh, you, know, you, could, you know, eat uh, according to LXX, you just uh, eat some lizards if you want some lizards. You see those. Uh, it, but <laughs> that being said to you guys, like, think about the awkwardness of the situation. You're on this ark with all these animals and you, you get to know them after a while, you know, like, have you ever kept a pet or, I mean, you bring in like an animal, uh, like farm animal. And the, the saying is you don't ever name it because once you name it, it, uh, you know, it becomes a pet. And so you'd, you'd hope that they didn't name these animals or whatever, but you know, the, the animals are on the ark with them and, and you know, like, uh, you know, it's, it's up, they're up on the menu now. So, and anyways, interesting transition in history and, I don't have the answers on this. This is one of, like I said, this is one of those passages that is the most confused to me to read the rest of scriptures and see that there are clean, unclean animals, even before this, right? Unclean animals and clean animals were not invented at Sinai. They go back before the flood. And uh, I'll be here, uh, interested to hear what you guys have to say on it. Back to you, Michael. All right. Yeah, I definitely want to open that discussion up later. Um, I don't know how far you got. I don't think you went too far. Um, so I'm going to start on nine because I don't have any on seven or eight. So um, KGV says, and I behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. So that word, your seed, uh, the, if you cannot tell, a lot of word studies in this chapter, um, they really stick out. So that word, your seed, used twice um, in Exodus 32, 13. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Yasharel your servants to whom you swore by yourself and say to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and all this land of which I have spoken, I will give to your descendants and they shall inherit it for, forever. So Genesis 9, he's establishing a covenant and with your seed, same word in Exodus 32, Abraham, Isaac, Asherel. Then Leviticus 22 says, uh, 
I don't have the verse, I don't think. Or that might have been the verse. Uh, I don't have the chapter. Then Yahuwah spoke to Moses, saying, Tell Aaron and his sons to be careful with the holy gifts of the sons of Israel, which they dedicate to me, so as to not profane my holy name. I am Yahuwah Elohim. Say to them, If any man among your descendants, or your seed, throughout your generations approaches the holy gifts, which the sons of Israel dedicate to the Lord, while he has an uncleanness, that person shall be cut off from me. I am Yahuwah. Again, so this is another covenant-typed verse. Uh, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel? Then Yahuwah spoke to Moses, saying, Tell Aaron, and it's talking about the priesthood. And that's interesting. You know, That's where Yeshua comes in and did it, did it correctly. Um, that if your descendants throughout your generation approach the holy gifts, which the sons of Israel dedicate, while he has an uncleanness, that person should be cut off. That's pretty interesting. Um, Leviticus 26 talks about 14. But if you do not obey me and observe all these commands, if you reject my statutes, despise my ordinances, and do not observe all my commands, and break my covenant, again, another covenant reference, then I will do this to you. I will bring terror on you, wasting disease and fever that will cause your eyes to fail and your life to ebb away. You will sow your seed in vain because your enemies will eat it. That word sow your seed is the same as your seed in Genesis 9. Um, but again, it's just obedience. Noah obeyed, his seed is blessed. Abraham, Isaac, Yasharel obeyed, their seed is blessed. A Aaron and his sons did not obey, they were not blessed. And Leviticus, same, same thing. If you do not obey, your seed will be in vain. And then Isaiah 66, you know, this is the prophetic verse. For, and this is interesting. For just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I make, will endure before me, declares Yahuwah. So will your descendants and your name endure. So that word descendants is your seed. And so this is new heavens and new earth. This is post, you know, if you believe new heavens and new earth come after the thousand years, there's descendants. What do you guys make of that? You know, I keep going back and forth. There's so many verses both in both camps that talk about this. And that, I, I don't know, I have to do a very deep study on this. But um, it's saying your descendants in and your name will endure after the new heavens and new earth. I don't know. I'll stop at nine and hand it back to Noel. Well, so when I talked earlier today about uh, spending time with Rivka, uh, I had a decision to make. Do I do research on rainbows or, um, or my daughter? So I don't have a lot on rainbows. And maybe it was just one of those things that, a lot of us here, I think probably everyone in the room, probably most people listening out there are uh, of the flat, they're the inhabiting the flat realm, uh, the flat motionless plane with us. And we have done a lot of look, look see Lou into rainbows. Uh, I will throw out this one interesting passage that came about during our revelation study when we went through Hebrew revelations. And um, let's see if I can pull this up. No, I'm not going to be reading from the Hebrew revelations. It's just your um, common... KJV. And it says this, then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun and his legs were like pillars of fire. And my original idea at that time was that this was just a random angel. Uh, I think I had made maybe connections even to uh, maybe like Uriel or something like that. I can't remember what the connection was at that time. And it was at that time, Michael and also Rob's uh, understanding that this may have been Yahushua Messiah. And it's just really interesting to see that he is um, has a rainbow around him because what we are seeing in here is that the covenant, the everlasting covenant, like it says in verse 16 here, and the bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between the word of Yahuwah and every living soul of all flesh that is upon the earth. And um, so that right there is, of course, Yahushua. He is the one that is the, the high priest, the intercessor uh, between the Most High and us. And um, so he's, he's the one that, you know, carries the bow with him. And I think that's a really uh, beautiful thought. One last thing, just a quick transition here, is that I have talked, and you guys know all this. I mean, we have talked a lot in this group about the, the transition from water to fire. And so here we clearly see that Yahuwah has changed his strategy. He says that he will not, he will no longer destroy the whole, that the key is the whole earth. He doesn't say like, I won't destroy, say, a city or, you know, something like that uh, with water, but uh, he will not destroy the whole earth with water anymore. Uh, that his new 
um, form of judgment is fire, his new preferred judgment. He has now made the transition, which we see with Sodom and Gomorrah. And, um, and then we see, again, and I, I have put forward the idea that we can see a massive heat index event all across the world that we see melted cities and uh, you know whole perhaps mountains that may have been buildings at one time that are melted destroyed by fire which are not talked about in history and it's like what's going on there uh, you guys know my thoughts on that uh, but it's interesting because the idea that he destroyed the earth with water wasn't a one-time event i'm fully convinced that he had destroyed the earth many times with water um, that of course genesis 1 1 as you guys know was a recreation event and then i pointed out in jasher where it said that before the flood he destroyed a third of the entire earth with water a huge flood that came and still they didn't repent so just kind of interesting to see now now we're in the transition and um that's all I have on that. Uh, Michael, I'm sure you have plenty on the rainbow. I'm going to hand it over to you, and then I'll just start going down the uh, down the grapevine. All right. Sounds great. Um, all right. Before I get to the rainbow, the only thing I'm going to point out from 12, 15, and 16 is how it's way different from the KGV. It mentions my word, the my word, Yahuwah, or Yahusha, and the word of the Lord. And so I just want to read those real quick. So number 12 says, and Yahuwah said, this is the sign of the covenant, which, which I establish between my word and between you and every living soul that is with you. Again, Masoretic takes that stuff out. 15 says, and I'll remember my covenant, which is between my word and between you and every living soul of all flesh. Again, Masoretic takes it out. And number 16, and the bow shall be in the cloud. And I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between the word of the Lord and every living soul. So... Again, just, you know, not saying the, the Targums, you know, unblemished by any means, but it does highlight the word of the Lord way more than the Masoretic took out. All right, rainbow time. Um, and it shall come to pass, number 14, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And Palestinian says, and it shall be that when I spread forth my glorious cloud over the earth, the bow shall be seen in the daytime while the sun is not sunk or hidden in a cloud. Okay. Um, on the there, so, rainbow, arch, cachette. So, after the great flood, Yahuwah establishes a covenant with Noah, promising he shall never bring another flood again that will destroy the lives of humans, animals, cattle, and birds. The sign of the covenant will be a rainbow that will come with a cloud, and whenever Yah sees the rainbow, he shall remember the everlasting covenant. So, Gematria time. So, the, it, where's Jason at? The interesting thing is the Gematria of the word Keshet, which is written in Hebrew in the letters Kof, Shin, Tav. Those letters create the sum of 800. For Kof equals 100, Shin equals 300, Tav equals 4. So, the word Keshet in Hebrew has the value of 800. I don't know. I just thought that was cool. You know me. I'm a numbers guy. And then, obviously, you know, the, the number 8, you know, um, has many significance. You know, the great eighth day, all that kind of stuff, circumcision. New beginnings. And so I thought that was pretty cool that the rainbow had that numerology. Um, so this chapter in Genesis 9, it, uh, this is, Genesis 9 talks about the rainbow as we're talking about it now, like the actual rainbow of the many colors. 13, 14, and 16 talk about that. Ezekiel 128 is the only other place in the Old Testament that mentions the word as a rainbow. That's pretty cool. Every other time, it's like a bow and arrow. So what do you guys make about that? That it's it's literally this chapter and then Ezekiel 128. I'd have to do a deeper research on that chapter, but I thought that was an interesting fact there. Um, number 15, it says, I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. A similar usage is found in Exodus 2.24, where Yah hears the cries of the Israelites in bondage, in Egypt, and remembered his covenant. So I just I just found that to be interesting. Um, okay, so number 17. Last week I mentioned chiastic structure. Um, and I want to talk about it again with this Noah story. Look at this. This is pretty cool. Um, did that not go through? Okay, there it is. Okay, so. <laughs> All right, if you want to read along. So... Chiastic structure of the Genesis flood narrative. So, Noah and his sons, all life on earth, curse on earth, flood announced, ark, 
all living creatures, food, animals in man's hands, entering the ark, waters increase, Yah remembers Noah, waters decrease, exiting the ark, animals, food, all living creatures, ark, no flood in the future, blessings on earth, all life on earth, Noah and his sons, amazing, chiastic structures of the Bible, awesome, I would look more into that. Um, Okay, so I'll do one more and then hand it off to Noah. Um, I butcher this name, the Noahic Covenant. <laughs> Noah, I see. No, Noah, Noahic Covenant. Um, you know, what are the three promises Yah declares? So he says, never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is evil. Never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Two of those were uh, chapter 8, and then 9.15 was uh, the second one. So, Noah and his generations were required in their turn to procreate, not shed human blood, because mankind is made in the image of Yah. In addition, man was forbidden to consume meat with blood in it, so the blood must be drained from the animals before consuming. But the covenant that Yah makes with Noah is unique, because Yah gives Noah a promise, but doesn't require anything from Noah in light of this promise. When Yah made a covenant with Adam, Adam was given one rule. When Yah made a covenant with Abraham, Abraham was required to follow Yah. Even with God, or even when Yah gave us the new covenant through the blood of Yeshua, we are required to accept it through faith and repentance. But Noah is given no such requirement. He is not bound in any way to accept the covenant. The covenant is entirely one-sided. Granted, and this says, you know, granted all the covenants are mostly, uh, you know, cited, but, um, we needed to respond where Noah didn't have to. Um, and so this is cool. So a covenant is a binding agreement between two or more parties. And there are three types of covenants. There's a kinship covenant. There's a suzerain vassal covenant. And then there's a royal grant covenant. So kinship, agreement between two equal parties with a few stipulations or requirements. Marriage, selling property, business agreements. That's a kinship. Suzerain vassal. So that's a, a king would make a promise to his subjects or a treaty between kings would be that depended on obedience to specific terms. You can think of this covenant as a conditional promise. And then here's Noah, the royal grant. So unlike the suzerain vassal agreements, a royal grant requires no action on the part of the beneficiary. It is an unconditional promise given from one party to the other. The only downside to a grant covenant is missing out on the promises. So... Noah, Noah, Abraham, and Yeshua have royal grant covenants from Yah. Moses and the nation of Israel were in suzerain vassal covenants. Um, like I said, there's no requirement in a grant covenant, just a promise. All Noah had to do was believe. Yah and follow his instructions. Well, I don't know about that, but okay. So some more on the royal grant co covenants. They were special covenants that the king or the suzerain made with exceptional rulers under them. The king granted a the ruler a gift or land as a reward for his precious demonstration of loyalty. These two type of covenants can be combined into one under the idea of probation. A ruler can be placed under a suzerain vassal covenant, but with the promise that after sec uh, successfully demonstrating their loyalty over a period of time, they may receive a greater reward. So, you know, there's a million things going in my, my head right now. Um, does this sound familiar? You know, we... What, what is one, one of our main promises? It's the land. It's heaven come down. It's New Jerusalem. Do these things. Believe and obey. That's a suzerain, a king. King makes a promise to his subjects. But then, a, a, you know, a, a royal grant is just, there's no action. It's just a beneficiary. Um, I, I just think about it in today's terms. It's just like, you know, you make your, your life insurance policy a beneficiary. They did absolutely nothing. And if you die, they, they gain the reward. Um, I thought that was cool. Um, if you guys want to do more research, I'm going to post that. And, uh, and I'll hand it off to Nona. All right. This is the the part I've been talking about for weeks, and I've been kind of highlighting a little bit about the grapes and saying I was going to put it off to this week. I'm excited about this. This is the big moment. I can't mess this up. I can't trip over this. And so I'm going to be jumping ahead of Michael here and, and talking about the, the grapes and the and the uh, Garden of Eden and so on, and the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil. And this is what it says in Genesis 9, 20 through 21 in the Targum. And Noah began to be a man working in the earth, which is interesting uh, in and of itself. 
uh, no commentary on that, but um, that, that, that does right there seem to line up with a lot of the Edemic literature that would say that the sons of Seth uh, were not um, tillers of the earth, that they were actually eating the, just the fruit off the trees. They, they were vegetarians. They, um, they would just pluck, you know, the fruit, uh, bananas or apples or oranges, berries, whatever they could find. And uh, which is interesting, too, because that's something that we later read in some, uh, the Ascension of Isaiah, that the the prophets, I think it was Amos and Yeshiahu and a couple others, they just they just lived off the berries on the hillsides, which is kind of interesting. And he found a vine which the river had brought away from the Garden of Eden. Something is telling me here that Noah was not eating those uh, those lizards in the LXX. And he planted it in a vineyard and it flourished in a day and it's. Grapes became ripe, and he pressed them out. All right. I, I've mentioned this several times to the point that some of you guys are going to roll your eyes, but there are new people here tonight. And, you know, nerd alert, I do find it really fascinating that in the um, the, the land, of, the merry old land of Israel, uh, where Jerusalem is, and uh, I know that there's a whole debate about whether this is the true land or not, Right outside of Jerusalem, they have uh, right, actually the, the city of, uh, of David, uh, Mount Zion, where the true temple was. They have found the um, uh, Meshelzedek Temple, what they claim to be a Meshelzedek Temple. What's fascinating about this is that they found in there uh, its main feature. The main feature of this Meshelzedek uh, Temple was to press grapes and make wine. Well, isn't that interesting? Because when you jump over and read the writings of Abraham, um, when, when Abraham is, um, he meets Noah at the the, the, the temple there, the Meshelzedek temple in, in Zion. Uh, Noah comes out and it says that, you know, he basically never really left the temple. He just made wine all day. And so for the rest of his days, he just was in there making wine. And so that's what the temple, the Meshulitic temple seems to show in Jerusalem. Really interesting. I had a, you know, like a nerd alert because I'm like, that, that's like, <laughs> that's where Noah pressed grapes, you know, like that's, that's like, that's pretty awesome. Uh, anyways, uh, so these grapes, uh, he gets them from, don't miss the part. He mixed, he gets them from the Garden of Eden and they flourished in a single day. So that's, uh, this is like Jack and the Beanstalk stuff right here. And he drank of the wine and was drunken. That's not good. And he made himself naked in the midst of his tents. Now, I'm not going to be commenting on the nakedness in and of itself uh, so much right now. But what I want to do is jump over to 3rd Baruch. And I have quoted from this several times in the past. But it, it's fascinating because it mirrors this whole passage. And 3rd and, um, Baruch, I need to do really more research on what the scholars claim. You, you guys know my opinion that I'm not really concerned with the scholars always say, but it's it is my understanding that Third Baruch um, is you know more of a Christian writing, right? Well, the reason I find that really fascinating is because by all accounts the Aramaic Targum uh, was not circulated amongst the Christians, that it was more of a Jewish thing. So you see what I'm saying here, the discrepancies. All right, and here's what it says. Uh, now, again, context is that Baruch is in the third heaven where paradise is. So he has gone to the Garden of Eden. He's with an angel as his guide. And he, he says, I pray thee show me which is the tree which led Adam astray. So Baruch is asking the angel, can you show me the, uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil? And here's the big shocking moment. And the angel says to me, it is the vine. The vine. The, it's, so he's saying it's grapes. But not just that. He says, which the angel Samael planted. Wait, what? So Samael is the same as Satan, uh, the angel of death. And he planted the vine in paradise. Uh, whereat Yahuwah Elohim was angry. So apparently, for whatever reason, we can all conjecture why at this point, but Elohim was angry that he planted this vine in there. And he cursed him in his plant, which while also on this account, he did not permit Adam to touch it. And therefore, the devil, being envious, deceived him through his vine. Now, here's my, here's my guess. I think that this wasn't just your normal grapes. Like, you go out there and you eat any grape. It's like, mm, this tastes good, but you're not drunk. It's like, you can eat a whole, you know, they're not fermented, obviously. I mean, you can eat a whole basket full of grapes. They're not fermented. They're just, you know, you got a sweet tooth, whatever. They're really good. 
but then we see something interesting here that these grapes, they flourished in one day. So there's something about the quality of these grapes that are very different than your normal grapes. These, after all, do come from paradise. It is my belief from all the things I put together that when Satan planted it, it wasn't that he planted grapes. Uh, I think there was something about that he he literally planted this to be the the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? That that you can choose um, you can choose basically sin, like that, that you could follow your sinful desires by being drunken. You you drink you eat from these uh, fruit and you become drunk very quickly, and you follow the desires of your heart. Uh, that is kind of what I think is going on here. All right, so. He did not permit Adam to touch it, and therefore the devil, being envious, uh, deceived him through his vine. And the angel said to me, when Elohim made the garden and commanded Michael to gather 200,003 angels uh, so that they could plant the garden. So that's interesting. So Michael is gathering 200,000 other angels, and they're all telling this garden together. So we don't often think about that, that when Adam and Eve were in the garden they didn't have to tend to it because you know they would be well hey there's michael there's uriel there's uh you know so on so forth. you just go down the list uh they're seeing all these other angels they're all telling the ground they're working it and of course adam and eve or uh, hava's job was to be the high priest right they're, they're not they're not getting their fingers dirty down there in the dirt they're just they're doing their priestly business anyway so the they planted the garden michael planted the olive and that's interesting in and of itself because Michael is the protector of Yasharel. And you see that the olive is identified with Yasharel. Gabriel planted the apple tree. So sorry that the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil is not an apple tree, according to this account. A wrong tree that the apple tree was framed. Uriel planted the nut. Raphael, the melon. And Satanael, or Satan, the vine. For at first his name in former times was Satanael, and similarly all the angels planted the various trees. And again I, Baruch, said to the angel, Adonai, show me the tree through which the serpent deceived Haven Adam. And the angel said to me, listen, Baruch, in the first place the tree was the vine. But secondly, the tree is sinful desire, which Satanael spread over Hava and Adam. And because of this, Elohim has cursed the vine because Satanael had planted it, and by that he deceived the, the uh, Adam and Hava. All right, so let me skip a few um, lines ahead. Now, this is, it talks about, I, I mentioned, I think last week or the week before about the 104,000 giants that were killed, which was really fascinating. And it says, and the, the water rose, um, uh, the water rose above the highest mountains, 20 cubits above the mountains. And Michael commented about that and how it, it basically went almost all the way up to the firmament, it was way up there. And the waters entered into the garden. Well, that's interesting. And, um, you know, we, we, we think about the garden like in physical terms uh, down on the ground, but it's almost like describing like a spiritual plane that it was in. And took all that was blooming, bringing out one shoot from the vine as Elohim withdrew the waters. So one shoot came out of the garden. Uh, like it kind of, you know, the water just came in, tipped in, it took out the chute. This is what Noah finds. And there was dry land and Noah went out from the ark and found the vine laying on the ground and did not recognize it, having only heard about it and its form. So according to this, it sounds like there were, there was no wine. There was no grapes uh, in the ancient world before the flood. Now, uh, that's what it appears like, and I'm trying to find if there were any texts to talk about that. So wine itself, fermented wine amongst humanity, according to this, could be a post-flood invention. And uh, that's uh, a discussion for another time of trying to find all those texts, but okay. So let me see here. Let me keep reading. Um, let's see. Where am I? Okay. All right. So when Elohim caused the deluge upon earth, I'm still reading from Third Baruch, by the way, and destroyed all flesh and 409,000 giants. Um, and the water rose 15 cubits above the highest mountains. All right, hold on here. I, I'm rereading this again. Um, okay, but he, Noah, found also the shoot of the vine, and he took it and was reasoning in himself, what then is it? And I came and spake to, to him and the things concerning it, and he said, shall I plant it or what shall I do? Since Adam was destroyed because of it, 
and let me not also meet with the anger of Elohim because of it. And he's, he's wise in this. He's like, look, I don't want to plant something from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I mean, look what happened to Adam and Eve. I don't want to repeat that. Uh, and he's got a brand new opportunity in a brand new world. Why destroy it? And saying these things, he prayed that Elohim would reveal to him what he should do concerning it. And when he had completed the prayer, which lasted 40 days, well, that's interesting. He's praying, probably fasting for 40 days, a uh, biblical theme. And having besought many things and wept, he said, Adonai, I entreat thee to reveal to me what I shall do concerning this plant. But Elohim sent his angel, uh, his name is Sarah Sale, and said to him, Arise, Noah, and plant the shoot of the vine. For thus says Yahuwah, its bitterness shall be changed into sweetness, and its curse shall become a blessing. And that which is produced from it shall become the blood of Elohim. And as though it, it and, and as through it the human race obtained condemnation, so again through Yahusha Hamashiach the Emmanuel will they receive in him the upward calling and the entry into paradise. Know therefore, O Baruch, that as Adam through this very tree obtained condemnation and was divested of the glory of Elohim. So also the men who now drink insatiably the wine which is begotten of it transgress worse than Adam and are far from the glory of Elohim and are surrounding themselves or surrendering themselves to the eternal fire for no good comes through it for those who drink it uh, to uh, surf surfeit do these things. Neither does a brother pity his brother nor father his son nor children their parents but from the drinking of wine comes all evil, such as murders, adulteries, fornications, perjuries, thefts, and such like. And nothing good is established by it. What it's basically saying is that if you thought the sin that Adam did through uh, partaking of this was bad, look at all the people who drink wine nowadays and look at all the terrible things they do. It's saying that they have fallen even further from the glory of Elohim, that that that. The, you know, when they are handed over to the tree of knowledge, of good and evil, to their sinful desires, uh, they, it's, yeah, do even worse acts. I mean, humanity is in a bad spot. All right. Now, the, so, but in quick review, according to the third Baruch, it actually lines up with the Aramaic Targum, and it shows you that Noah, he didn't want to plant it, but he was instructed by Yahuwah to plant it and uh, partake of it. And now I'm going to save that commentary for Mike, Michael to jump in first if he wants to. Uh, but we're going to see that there is an exact scene played out from the first time. It's repeated again when Adam and Eve were in front of the, the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And when Noah and um, his wife and his son were... Um, you know, there at the uh, the same same fruit from the tree. But before we get there, before I hand it back to Michael, I'm going to read from one other interesting passage, and this comes from the Apocalypse of Abraham. Uh, I did a study with Zen Garcia uh, about a couple months ago, and we went through this. Uh, we read this whole thing together, and uh, but this tells the same story. And here's what it says: When Elohim caused the deluge upon Earth and destroyed all flesh and four hundred and nine thousand giants. So it's interesting. All all three texts they give a different number of giants. I actually I didn't tell you guys. I read from the Greek and the Slavonic uh, third Baruch, and they all and, and this they all give a different number. There was hundreds of thousands of, but they don't agree on the numbers. And that's you know probably just a translation thing. And through the years, and the waters rose fifteen cubits above the highest mountains. Then the water entered into paradise and destroyed every flower, but it removed wholly without the the bounds the shoots of the vine and cast it outside. So. This is the, the vine for the tree of knowledge. Again, cast it out. And when the earth appeared out of the water and Noah came out of the ark, he began to plant of the plants which he found. But he found also the shoot of the vine. And he took it and was reasoning in himself, what then is it? And I came and spake to him the things concerning it. So uh, apparently Abraham is talking to the same angel who was talking to Baruch. And he said, shall I plant it or what shall I do? Since Adam was destroyed because of it, let me not also meet with the anger of Elohim because of it. And saying these things, he prayed that Elohim would reveal to him what he should do concerning it. And when he had completed the prayer, which lasted 40 days, and having besought many things and wept, he said, uh, hold on here, hold on. I'm, I am reading from the Slavonic. That is so embarrassing. All right. <laughs> I'm like, well, this, this story is way too familiar. Okay. Let me try this one more time. Let's just uh, let's do a little reset. All right, we're in the the, uh, the apocalypse of Abraham. All right, this is what it says. 
Now look again. In the, I must have done a copy and paste like twice or something like that. It happens from time to time. Now look again in this picture and see who it is who seduced Hava. And what is the fruit of the tree? And you will know what it is what it is to be and how it shall be with your seed among the people at the end of the days of the age. And all that you cannot understand, I will make known to you, for you are well-pleasing in my sight. And I will tell you of these things which are kept in my heart. And I looked into the picture and my eyes ran to the side of the Garden of Eden. Um, and this is, of course, Abraham looking into this picture. And I saw there a man of imposing height and mighty in stature. There's another reference to how big Adam was. A giant, Incomp incomparable in aspect, and he was embracing a woman who likewise approximated to the aspect of his size and nature. That's fascinating. I, I, especially when we're looking to the millennial kingdom stuff and some of these buildings which were built for very large people. And I think that these were some of the resurrected uh, saints, that there were some very large in stature uh, resurrected. And they were standing under, under a tree of the Garden of Eden, but the fruit of this tree was like a bunch of grapes of the vine. So there you go. And standing behind the tree was one who had the aspect of a serpent having hands and feet like those of a man and wings on his shoulders, six pair of wings, so that there were six wings on the right and six on the left. And as I continued looking, I saw the man and the woman eating the fruit in the tree. And I said, who are these who are embracing and who is the one between them who is behind the tree? And what is the fruit that they're eating? And he said, this is the council of the world. This one is Adam and this one who is their desire upon the earth is Eve or Hava. But he who is between the purposes of godliness and the beginnings on the way to perdition, even as Azel. Point is that that also uh, agrees that it was great. So just wanted to throw those out there. And when I get back, I'll talk about uh, the, the scene that unfolds because of Noah eating the grapes and sending it back your way, Michael. Awesome. So I have a lot on this part, and I think you want me to talk first on the curse and all that. So I will do that. And then I'll leave the, the what is it, the School of Shem for my last part, because um, that's pretty interesting. I have, a, I have a decent amount on that. So number 20 is uh, where I left off. So, and Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. That word planted was used a few other times. Genesis 2.8, we already talked about that. Yahuwah Elohim planted a garden towards the east. So same thing. And then Genesis 21, Abraham planted a tamarisk tree at Beersheba, and there he called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. So I found this nice little summary on what happened there, and I'm just going to read a little bit of it. So just after the expulsion of Hagar and immediately before the binding of Isaac, um, Abraham encounters Abimelech, the king of Gerar, along with the chief of his troops, Phicol, and a so they do in exchange. Abraham rebukes the two for attempting to steal his well. As a means of securing possession of the well, Abraham gives the gift of sheep and oxen to Abimelech. And the two of them make a pact. Abraham tells Abimelech, you were to accept these seven ooze from me as, as proof that I dug this well. The exact place is then named Beersheba, um, which means the two of them swore an oath. And then immediately after the pact, we are told that Abraham's Philistine friends, quote, return their home, homeland, and then Abraham planted a tamarisk tree at Beersheba. Um, okay, so that was a little bit more context on why he did that. Now I'm going to talk more about the tamarisk tree. Um, they're often referred to as salt cedars because they're a type of evergreen tree that produces a salt-like substance. And this is cool. Secondly, in the evenings, as the temperature gets cooler, these salt crystals form on the branches of these trees and absorb the moisture that is in the air forming little droplets of water on the branches. And then when the sun rises in the morning and the heat begins to evaporate it, the water droplets burst, creating a fine mist, um, kind of like a natural form of air conditioning. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, they also, this tree also produces a honey-like substance that is sweet to taste. This substance has been referred to as manna because of its similarities to the biblical manna that sustained the Israelites in the desert over 400 years after Abraham planted the tree. Um, amazingly, the tamarisk tree grows very slowly and, and can live several hundred years. And then this, this commentary said, why did he plant it? And so trees were often used as memorials. Um, and it's therefore appropriate that Abraham should honor the Most High by planting this, this tree. Um, it'll be a permanent memorial between these two. Okay, so 21. Uh, I'm only going to talk about the difference. So and he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And look what the Palestinian says. And he found a wine which the river had brought away from the Garden of Eden. And he planted it in a vineyard. 
and it flourished in a day, and its grapes became ripe. And he pressed them out, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he made himself naked in the midst of the tent. So this, these were from a river out of the Garden of Eden. Interesting. A vine found there. <laughs> Powerful stuff. Okay, so 22. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. So I went down this huge rabbit hole. I didn't have time to finish the connection. Um, there were so many passages that talked about this that I was trying to make a, a connection. I think I found something in 25 that would be my best guess, my dog in the race. But I want to read um, commentary on this. So it says, why would Noah curse his grandson Canaan for something that his son Ham did? So the answer lies in the phrase that Ham saw the nakedness of his father. So at first, our modern reading, we assume that saying has a plain meaning, Ham, Ham saw his dad naked. But there was evidence from scripture to suggest that this is not what was meant at all. So consider these passages, also written by the same author, Moses. So Leviticus 18 says, You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father, which is the nakedness of your mother. She is your mother, you shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife, it is your father's nakedness. And Leviticus 20, If a man lies with his father's wife, he has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall be surely be put to death. Leviticus 20, 11. So Notice the usage of uncover the nakedness of your father, which is the nakedness of your mother. So Moses uses the idiom, then he explains it right away, so the meaning is not lost. So in both cases, Moses, the author of both books, um, was using an idiom to basically don't have relations with your mother, or don't have relations with your father's wife. So being that the passages in Genesis were written by the same author, it may be said that in Genesis 9, Moses was using this idiom to say that Ham had relations with his mother. Or Noah's wife. Um, either way, um, yeah, so interesting, these idioms are never used in scripture to describe a, a homosexual relationship. So where do people get that? Is that the rabbinic teaching? At least based on this, this commentary. But I thought it was really interesting, and I have um, some more on that on 25. But uh, okay, so 23 says, And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And continues and continues. So that word covered was used a few times in, in interesting parallel. So Exodus 14, Moses reached out with his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal state at daybreak. While the Egyptians were fleeing right into it, Yahuwah overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. So it's like a protection, a covering. Pharaoh's entire army had gone to the sea after them. Not even one of them remained because the waters covered their chariots, just like these two uh, sons covering their father. Um, Second Chronicles 5, King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel were assembled with him before the ark, were sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. Then the priests brought the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place and to the inner sanctuary of the house, to the Holy of Holies, under the wings of the cherubim. Now here it is. For the cherubim spread their wings over the place of the ark so that the cherubim made a covering over the ark and its poles. So these these angels are, are spreading their wings as a covering over the ark for protection. Same word, as the waters return and cover the chariots and cover the nakedness. And then finally, Psalms 106, 9, he rebuked the Red Sea and it dried up. He led them through the depths as through a desert. He saved them from the hand of the adversary. He redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. Water covered their foes. So water, if you follow along, you know my, my belief that water is the power of Yah, and it can do great things. It protects his people. Um, okay, 24. All I'm doing is reading the difference because the Palestinian goes way more detailed. So I'm not going to read the KGV, but on number 24, it says, And Noach awoke from his, from his wine and knew by the relation of a dream what had been done to him by Ham, his son, who was inferior in worth on the account that he had not begotten a fourth son. <laughs> I think that gives it away. And, uh, and 25 is what I'm going to show here. So, um, and again, Stephanie pointed this one out. So this was another good take on her. Um, so 25 says, and he said, curse be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren. So a little etymology before I get into it. The possible etymology of Canaan could mean lowlands. So to be low, humble, depressed, 
and also refers to the color purple. So that Canaan and Phoenicia would be synonymous with the land of purple. I thought that was cool. Okay, so if reading 24 and 25 in the Palestinian, and Noah awoke from his wine and knew by the relation of a dream what had been done to Ham, his son, who was inferior in worth on the account that he had begotten a for, not begotten a fourth son. And he said, the curse is Canaan, who is his fourth son, a serving servant shall be to his brethren. So Canaan is Noah's fourth son. What, what do you, what does that mean? Um, is, is it basically his stepson? Did Ham have relations with his mother and produced a son? I don't know. And I'm for, totally forgetting what Stephanie said. <laughs> I hope she puts it in the comments because she added way more or at least speaks up afterwards. Please do that. Um, okay, so what, are the, what does Book of Jubilees talk about with this? So Jubilees 10. And Canaan saw the land of Lebanon to the river of Egypt, that it was very good, and he went not into the land of his inheritance to the west. So he was given land and did not go. And he dwelt on the land of Lebanon eastward and westward from the border of Jordan, and from the border of the sea. And Ham, his father, and Cush, and Mitzrayim, his brother, said to him, Thou, and this is interesting, thou hast settled in a land which is not thine, and which did not fall to us by law. So it appears these Canaanites are have settled in land that was not their own. Does that sound familiar? What do you guys make of that? I'll throw that out there, but I thought Jubilees made an interesting case there. Okay, finally, the curse of Ham. So what is it? Um, so some other takes on this story. So the Targum Ankylos has Ham gossiping about his father's drunken disgrace in the street, in quotes. So that being held up to public mockery was what had angered Noah. And as the Cave of Treasure puts it, Ham laughed at his father's shame and did not cover it, but laughed about it and mocked it. Um, so in verse, and this was cool, I thought. Actually, no, not this one yet. But uh, Noah, in verse 25, Noah refers to Shem and Japheth as the brethren of Canaan. Whereas in verse 18, they're identified as his uncles. And the Table of Nations presents Canaan and Mitzrayim, Egypt, among the sons of Ham. And in Psalms, Egypt is equated with Ham. Um, okay, so it is new, noteworthy that the curse was made by Noah, not by Yah. So some scholars claim that when a curse is made by a man, it can only have been effective if Yah supports it. Unlike the curse of Ham and his descendants, which was not confirmed by Yah, or at least it is not mentioned in the Bible. What do you guys think about that? Okay, so four, this is the Dead Sea Scrolls, 4Q252 states that since Ham had already been blessed, and this is interesting, this is what I was talking about, since he has already been blessed by Yah in Genesis 1, and God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, he cannot now be cursed by Noah. He couldn't go back on that. So that's their explanation on why the son was cursed instead of Ham. I thought that was pretty interesting. I never noticed that. Um, Josephus argued that Noah refrained from cursing Ham because of his near, his nearest of kin, and so cursed Ham's son instead. Book of Jubilee. Okay, I already read that one. Earmuffs for this one. People with children, earmuffs, please, if you want to. Um, yeah, earmuffs. So, rabbinic. They, they claim that uh, this curse was uh, castration. I'm not going to read that much. Or abuse. Or abuse. Um, I'm not going to give their point for the castration, but the abuse I thought was interesting. So the argument for abuse from the text draws an analogy between and he saw. So that was written in two places in the Bible. So with regard to Ham and Noah, and Ham, the father came and saw the nakedness of his father. And also in Genesis 34 too, it was written. And when Shechem saw, when Shechem, the sons of Hamar saw her, Dinah, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. So this is where they're getting the abuse part, if you can read between the lines of what I'm saying. Again, rabbinic, trying to give you every interpretation that I've found on these. And I hope Stephanie put, put in the notes, but uh, that's all I got for now. I have a lot on the school of Shem, but I'll let no go first. Well, as you can see, I mean, I'm not going to go through all that again, but it it... As you guys can see, it, it very clearly says that Noah, let me pull up the actual verse here. 
<clears throat> and now I, I just lost it. But okay, verse 24, verse 25, he's a cursing Canaan who is his fourth son. So think about that. No only has three sons, now he has a fourth son. Now think about some of the implications about this. Well, before we do, let's just put this in another another way. Let's say that uh, even though even though Michael pointed out that Moses is using a very specific language of seeing your father's nakedness and what this implies, uh, where are some of the passages that talk about that? Uh, I had them written down here. I'll find them. Oh yeah, there's quite a few in Leviticus chapter eight verses six twenty goes on and on and on. I'm not going to read it all because it's just it's relentless. You can read chapter eight and it goes on and on about the the nakedness of so and so and how it's all related to sexual relations. Uh, the most obvious one is Leviticus eighteen eight and it says, "Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's wife. It is thy father's nakedness." All right. So within this this language, or as Michael said, an idiom. The nakedness of your father, uncovering it, is to uncover his woman, his wife. Now, I, for one, do not think that Noah's wife was Ham's mother. And you might be like, what? How is that possible? You know, the birds and the bees and all that. Well, this is where the writings of Abraham just is so phenomenal. And it just it, it's like, you know, the glove fits. And... It talks about how Noah, before the, the flood, he actually had two different wives, and one of them was Naima, who is talked about. We went through that in the lineage. It was uh, she was a daughter of Cain, and um, she he was instructed to uh, take her as a wife, and she gave forth Ham. I've made the case in the past that because when you're looking at uh, the book of Jasher, Jubilees, Genesis, uh, writings of Abraham, all these different texts, none of them agree on the birth order, whether it was Ham, Japheth, or uh, Shem that was born first. They're all different orders. Uh, none of them seem to agree. That's, an always, that's always a head scratcher. But I've made a case uh, in other parts of scripture where the idea is put forth like, uh, think of uh, uh, Ishmael uh, through uh, Tamar. The idea was that Sarah was going to raise uh, him as her own child. And so she would have been accredited in the genealogy as, you know, Abraham and Sarah, you know, and, and uh, Ishmael. And of course it, it didn't turn out that way. And she, you know, they had to kick Hagar and Ishmael out of the camp. So the idea is, is that even though Noah's wife is accredited uh, with having these three children, it's, it's, it's a son that was taken under her wing or under her umbrella, but Ham was a child of, Cain, uh, you're seeing the the seed of Satan continue, uh, but it's it's a very interesting scene. It's it's the same thing played out. Noah gets drunk. Um, Noah uh, Ham goes in. Let me let me back up here. So let me let me just say, like, if if my twin sons were to they were to see me in my bedroom, they were seeing me naked. And we're not even talking about the Aramaic target at this point. We're just going with the, the Masoretic. It would be a very odd thing for me. You know, my, my son is out there snickering about it. You know, he snickers to my, his other brother. But, you know, I saw my, you know, my dad's private part. It would, if I went out there and I'm like, you know, curse be you and curse be your son and all of your descendants. Like that would be like, whoa, like <laughs> let's reel it back several notches here. I mean, that's pretty intense. For something like that, you know, he sees Noah naked in his tents, and you know, maybe Noah is doing something naughty, what, or whatever. But it's like, what were you, what were you even doing in the, his tent, right? So, however, if one of my sons were to, you know, uh, go with, you know, take my woman as their own and rape her and have a child, that's a whole nother scenario where I've got a baby now, and I'm like. Ooh, this is my this is my son, and it's my grandson at the same time. You guys see what I'm talking about here, all right? But he, so here's here's what I think was happening when Ham goes and talks to his two brothers. What he was really doing was he was saying, "I'm in charge now. I'm in control." You know, your mother. I just raped her. Uh, she's my she's my woman now. I'm in control. I'm uh, I'm taking over the ship. I'm course correcting everything. As we know, Ham went and stole the the garments uh, that was Adam and Eve's, which finally ends up in Nimrod's hand. And you know, he's he's a bad dude, right? And as Michael pointed out, wh what did the sons of Canaan do? They go take over land that wasn't theirs. They were 
the, the entire seat of Satan is always trying in any way possible to destroy the messianic line, to destroy the inheritance. They want it for themselves. And it's something we also see with the Edomites later down the line. All right. Let me see if I can find some other passages here that talk about this. Oh, here's another really interesting thing, too, that part of the frustration here is that all indications that I can find is that Noah would have never been able to have relations with his wife ever again. I mean, think about how much this this sucks. I, all the women were destroyed before the flood. He picked his wife. They go on the ark together. They're going to repopulate the earth. Noah and his wife could have still had more children. He lived for another few hundred years or so. Uh, but right afterwards, it goes bad in that after Ham defiled his wife, his woman, the, uh, he might have it again, but there's good indications he he didn't. Here's why. Let's read from Jubilees chapter 33. And this is the account uh, with uh, Reuben and Yaakov. All right. Reuben commits the sin of Ham all over again. And Reuben saw Bilhah, Rachel's maid. Now, keep in mind, Yaakov, uh, the, the children of Israel have four mommies. All right. So when we get into the whole, you know, how <laughs> uh, polygyny debate and how that, that was never Yah's plan. Well, he he chose Israel to have four mommies. Just point that, throw that out there. Uh, so and Reuben saw Boha, Rachel's maid, the concubine of his father, bathing in water in a secret place. So what was he doing in a secret place to go check her out? And he loved her. Uh oh. And he hid himself at night and he entered the house of Boha at night. And he found her sleeping alone on a bed in her house, and he lay with her. Basically, he raped her. And she awoke and saw, and behold, Reuben was lying with her in the bed. So she didn't even apparently wake up until the deed was done. And as she uncovered the border of her covering and seized him, she cried out, which is what you're supposed to do in Torah. It's too bad he did the deed first, but... Uh, she cried out as soon as she found out and discovered that it was Reuben. And she was ashamed because of him and released her hand from him. And he fled. And she lamented because of this thing exceedingly and did not tell it to anyone. And when Yaakov returned and sought her, she said unto him, I am not clean for thee, for I have been defiled as regards thee. For Reuben has defiled me and has lain with me in the night. And I was asleep and did not discover until he uncovered my skirt and slept with me. And Yaakov was exceedingly wroth with Reuben because he had lain with Bilhah, because he had uncovered his father's skirt. So there again, you see, he uncovered his father's skirt. And Yaakov did not approach her again. So there you have it, because Reuben had defiled her. And as for any man who uncovers his father's skirt, his deed is wicked exceedingly, for he is abominable before Yahuwah. For this reason, it is written and ordained on the heavenly tablets that a man should not lie with his father's wife and should not uncover his father's skirt, for this is unclean. They shall surely die together, the man who lies with his father's wife and the woman also, for they have wrought uncleanness on the earth. And there shall be nothing unclean before our Elohim and the nation which he has chosen for himself in a possession. And again, it is written a second time, cursed be he who lies with the father, with the wife of his father. For he that uncovereth his father's shame and all and all the holy ones of Yah Yahuwah said, so be it, so be it. So again, with, with this, Reuben is not actually sleeping with his mother. It's he's coveting um, a woman that is not his, uh, that belongs to his father. And here we see once again uh, a confirmation of this. This one comes from the Testament of Reuben, uh, which was uh, part of the 12 patriarchs. And it says this, and now my, this is Reuben talking to his sons. And now my children love the truth and it will preserve you. Hear ye the words of Reuben, your father. Pay no heed to the face of a woman, nor associate with another man's wife, nor meddle with affairs of womankind. Uh, <laughs> after this unfortunate episode, apparently he, it's almost like an alcoholic who they can't even deal with alcohol anymore. Once they, you know, it's like he can't even deal with women anymore. He apparently had a lot of lust in his heart. It was easy for him just to step away from the game. For had I not seen Bilha bathing in a covered place, I had uh, not fallen into this great iniquity. For my mind, taking in the thought of the woman's nakedness, suffered me not to sleep until I had wrought the abominable thing. Now, we had discussed in the past about what lusting is. This is clearly lusting. Okay, It's not finding a woman attractive. It is not, um, you know, is not 
it's not even thinking like, wow, I'd like to um, appropriate with her, you know, love her, whatever. It's like, this is what lust is. It's like you, you, you change this woman into an object of your lust where you, you just, you know, want to have your way with her and it just dominates your thinking like that. That is what I think Yahusha is, is talking about, not finding a, a, a woman attractive or beautiful. Uh, okay, so he didn't sleep that night. Okay, and for a while, Yaakov, our father, had gone to Yitchak, his father, uh, when we were in in Eder, near to uh, Bethlehem. Belha became drunk and was asleep. So this is interesting. So this says here that Belha was drunk. This explains why she didn't know until after the deed. Same thing happened with Noah. He was drunk. He didn't know. Belha became drunk and was asleep uncovered in her chamber. Having therefore gone in and beheld uh, her nakedness, I wrought the impiety with without her perceiving it and leaving her sleeping i departed and forthwith the angel of elohim revealed to my father concerning my impiety and he came and mourned over me and here's the key right here and he touched her no more so that's too bad and let's see i think that's all i have on that back to you michael <clears throat> Alrighty, I'll finish my part up. I just have some on the school of Shem. So that is number 27. So and I know Mary was talking about that earlier. And just coincidence, we're going to talk about it. So Yahuwah shall lar- enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in tents of Shem. Canaan shall be a servant. So before we get to the school of Shem, I'm going to talk about in the tents. In the tents. So the word study, last one of the night. Psalm 78 says, He leveled a path for his anger. He did not spare their souls from death, but turned their lives over to the plague and struck all the firstborn in Egypt, the first and best of their vigor, in the tents of Ham. Kind of fits there, in the tents. Um, Psalms 84, For a day in your courtyards, this is a popular one, is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than live in the tents of the wickedness. Another negative tent there. Uh, Psalms 118, The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. The sound of joyful shouting and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord performs, performs valiantly. So just a few examples of being in the tents of somebody. And again, just it's tents of the righteousness or tents of the wickedness. You know, choose the path. Okay, Palestinian. Yahuwah shall beautify the borders of Japheth, and his sons shall be proselytized in the, and dwell in the schools of Shem. And Canaan shall be a servant to them. So in the KGV, it's in the tents of Shem, in the Palestinians, and those who dwell in the schools of Shem. So I looked and found a decent amount, and it looks like some of them are repetitive, and I didn't do my due diligence, but I'll read some. So... According to tradition, Rebecca feared she might miscarry and decided to go to the school of Shem to inquire. There she was told that two nations were in her womb and two people from within shall be divided. So that's one time. I uh, found Mount Moriah, also called school of Shem. Mount Moriah. What do you guys think about that? So there's another story that after the Akedah, or the binding of Isaac, um, he went off to the school of Shem and Eber. I thought that was pretty cool. So that's where Isaac went after they, you know, after he was let go. Um, Yaakov ent- enters the school of Shem and Eber to absorb the Torah value system that will allow him to survive Laban and to not to fall spiritually and become Laban in the form of Yaakov. So Jacob went to the school of Shem as well. The book of Jasher says that after Shem died, Jacob returned home from the school of Shem and Eber, where he had spent many years of his life. And this looks similar to the first one, but I'll share it again. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took his wife, Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, and Aramean from Padan, the sister of Laban, the Aramean. And Isaac prayed before Yahuwah concerning Rebekah, his wife, because she was barren. And Yahuwah answered him, and Rebekah and his wife conceived. And the children pushed one another in her womb. She said, if such is the tribulation of children, why now do I have children? And she went to the school of Shem 
<coughs> the great to beseech mercy from before the Lord. And the, and the Lord said to her, two people are in your womb. So <clears throat> that's what I found in the school of Shem. Just some additional context, uh, Rebecca and not Moriah and Isaac. Um, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice and that's all I got for tonight. I'll hand off to know. Yeah, in the coming weeks in the Genesis Targum, we'll definitely go more into the school of Shem. They, they it has some stuff to say on it and uh, we'll cover those in the future. With that, I'll go, hand it over to you guys as well. Uh, it looks like there were, you know, definitely some things you might want to talk about. We covered a lot of subjects tonight. So this is, hopefully you guys took notes, handing it over to you guys. The defense rests. Did anyone have anything on the, in Genesis, on the eating of animals? Did... There's always, of course, conversation, uh, heated conversation to be had about anything that has to do with polygyny of the multiple wives and the mess that we see in, in those situations with Reuben and Belha and so on and so forth. Something, um, something I didn't notice before, Noel, was that um, <clears throat> the, the, the other two brothers... They, I, I, for some reason, I, I even though I remember that there was like that, you know, the whole uncovering the nakedness of your father had to do with having sex with your mother. <laughs> it didn't clue into me until just now that it's, the other brothers literally went in and and they covered their mother, which was which is kind of interesting that they you know they didn't co they may have covered you no know, at the same time but they also they covered her without looking without even looking. Um, and they, 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 they like turn their faces away so that they couldn't see anything so that there seems to be like another element of like not just not just not having sex with her but not even like looking and and like observing that thing which i thought was i don't know interesting but it, it wasn't like touched on in like a specific sense but there's i think there's something interesting there it's just like it's avoiding anything at all Right, and you know, you, you, I could show you guys paintings and art and so on of this famous scene of of covering uh, their father's nakedness, and Shem and Japheth they're walking in backwards with the sheet. They're trying not to look, and Noah's laying there naked and trying to cover him. And it, it doesn't. If if you were actually to show in a picture of them covering their mother, people would be like, "What?" I mean, it would just. It's one of those things like. Why is this so not talked about? Is this really that hidden? Is it because uh, seminary students and others, they really haven't studied, read through the Torah, and they know what the Father's nakedness is? I, I'm, I'm amazed that we can have this discussion today, and people don't know. They, they were never told this. Um, and so there's, there's something clearly being hidden. Um, and, and that being said, when it comes to father's nakedness, like if this were purely just Shem seeing his dad naked, I find that hard to believe. I mean, you go to the Middle East today and uh, dudes, they swim together naked. It, it's kind of just a fact. Like there's a reason men and women, they don't bathe together. You know, women, they have their, you go to like a, uh, there was a, I went to the Sea of Galilee. And Galilee is beautiful, by the way. If 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 you were to spend anywhere within Israel, Galilee is just a stunningly beautiful place. And I was surprised. I went there, and the uh, some rabbinical dudes they started undressing, and they were there with their sons. They stripped down, and they went in the water. And there was a beach where no women were allowed. And I'm like, huh, okay. So um, if if you're not supposed to see your dad naked. Um, that was some serious issues right there. And obviously they didn't read it that way. They were proficient in the Torah and they're like, no, a son can, can see his dad naked. It's, it's, that's, you know, it's not sexual. Right. So it's just like, um, from the movie I watched recently, Captain Fantastic or something, <laughs> the guy's just standing, standing in the doorway of the bus and he's just completely naked. And then some guy walks by, looks at him funny and he's like, it's just a penis. <laughs> it's like, it's like there's there's nudity is not the problem, right? Um, and and 
from what you were saying, it seems like Shem and Japheth that was their that was their actual mother, not their. Um, and for for him, it was his half mother, or, or like his surrogate mother, his like stepmother. So right now, if if it was his real mother, that just makes it all the more sick and twisted, right? So I mean, if we don't, the only account I have ever seen that says that Ham came from a different mother was the writings of Abraham. In my opinion, though, that makes tons of sense. Um. And so you guys think about in a lot of households, and this is why sexual abuse happens in a lot of uh, – this, uh, this might be a personal topic for people, so I apologize if I'm trudging on anything uh, very private. But it, in a lot of mixed households, um, it seems that a lot of the times, you know, like a father uh, will come in and those aren't his daughters. You know, it was from a former marriage, and that's where a lot of abuse situations happen where uh, uncles or, you know, it, it's – it. Other people that aren't related, they come in and they they do some terrible things. And so uh, it, to me, it, it makes kind of a lot of sense that Ham would have done that if she wasn't his mother. It just makes more sense to me um, in his eyes. It, it, it's the same situation of the first thing you see when Absalom uh, comes in and takes over David's throne. The first thing he does he doesn't sleep with his own mother. He goes and sleeps with all of David's concubines. And in fact, it said afterwards that David never uh, slept with them again. And so th that's something you would do to overthrow, to overturn a throne. Unfortunately, in these situations, the queens, the concubines, stuff, they were the most in danger because they were, you know, the, the new, the new guy shows up and he sits on the throne and overturns the old husband, the king, he goes and he sleeps with the women to claim his dominance. Um, and so that is, you know, that seems to be what's happening here. You literally see like Satan. Um, I mean, it had to be a very demonic scene. And you see, I've never read anything where it said straight up like Satan embodied him or anything like that. But there seems to be um, an implication there that Satan is trying to overturn uh, the throne. You know, he's getting his revenge for Yahuwah destroying the whole earth and all of Satan's work. Um, so the, the, the line was posed, maybe Ham seduced her and not rape. That, I mean, that's a possibility, but it seems like if we're looking at Reuben and Belha and, you know, Noah is drunk. So what is she doing in the tent while he's drunk? Right? Like she, she appears to be, maybe it's a separate tent. Uh, maybe they're in two different tents. I don't know. Um, but it, it just seems to me like it was probably more like a um, a rape situation. Yeah. Like the he, only like, well, oh, let me just ahead. say, I was going to say that Noah never turned it on his wife. Like he never, like with Adam and Eve, you know, Yahuwah, he judges Eve and he judges Adam. Uh, Eve was responsible. You never see, like with the case of Belha or Noah's wife, neither one of them come across as responsible to me. Um, now, we're not given any indication that Noah's wife screamed like Belha did, uh, but it does say that Noah perceived what happened. So, I don't know. Take that for what it is. Go ahead. Yeah, that, that was my point that, you know, there was nothing mentioned about her screaming or crying out or fighting him off or anything like that. And as closely as people live to each other uh, during those times, because they were a very close-knit community, you would think if she had cried out and had fought that someone would have heard and come running. That's the only reason I brought it up. So Mary Ann points out that the school ship has been on my mind a lot lately. I homeschool my two kids, and that's my goal to try to mimic what it should have been like and teach what was taught. It's my aspiration. Well, let me just point out that here at the Unexpected Cosmology, uh, we are accepting the essays of students who uh, want to write about uh, like truth or material, Torah-based or anything like that, and uh, I am publishing them, and they can be anonymous. So if you want to ascribe to the School of Shem, be sure to send in your child's paperwork. Uh, no, but all that's it, that I'm being serious about that, that uh, I call it Truther's School and um, all the homeschool parents out there, 
if you want them to like write, you know, something that's, you know, really, you know, true to their base, it could be any age, it could be five years old, it could be 12, 15, whatever. Um, I do publish them and we could be anonymous. You don't have to know who it is or whatever, but the school of Shem, we'll get more into in the, in the upcoming weeks. Um, my belief is that now during the, the, the specific, no, and my belief is that the school of Shem uh, he was Michelle Zedek by that point, all right? And he was no longer mortal. I put the pregnant pause there on purpose. I should have probably kept it a little bit longer. I actually think that by the time you get to Abraham, by the time you get to Yitzhak and Yaakov, all three of them went to the school of Shem, and we'll get, we'll get there. I believe that Shem was no longer mortal, that he was an immortal, that he was a type of Enoch type of creature on the earth, that there was some sort of um, portal that was on Mount Zion that connected to paradise. And so when it said that Yaakov and Yitchak went to the school of Shem, what it's actually saying is that they weren't physically on the earth. And again, the target we'll talk about that. Now, what's interesting is that, uh, so I'll go ahead and bring this up now. There, there are, when we look at the two timelines, I, I've told you before that I believe that the LXX is the more accurate timeline. Okay, the 7,000-year timeline deception, as I call it. The LXX spreads things out radically uh, longer, and it of course corrects some things, but there's only three problems I have ever encountered. If the LXX is correct and not the Masoretic timeline, then... Uh, Three characters are way too old. One is Shem, the other is Nimrod, and the other is King Og. King Og had to be ancient. Like we talk about no one lives over a thousand years. He would have had to live like 16 or 1700 years. I mean, really, really old. And, um, and so I've really worked on these issues. And, uh, but I, I, I think that the easiest one to solve and, and the Targum straight out says that he, Og lived a long time, but Yahuwah purposely had him live a long He would have been a god on this earth. I mean, that guy would have been, like, revered by everybody, Og. Um, but I think that at some point, Shem did die. And I actually wonder, I, this is maybe a little bit more out there for some of you. I kind of wonder if there were multiple Nimrods. That's a whole different discussion. Uh, but even historically, when we look at the, uh, the different... Uh, People who are supposedly Nimrod, one was Gilgamesh, you know, that there may have been multiple Nimrods. In fact, the um the um the Nazarene Acts of the Apostles mentions Nimrod the First. It was Nimrod the First that introduced fire. And it's like, well, what do you mean Nimrod the First? Is it like Nimrod the second and the third? But anyways, going back to that, yeah, we'll get there. And um we don't know at what point uh Shem died or ascended. But um, uh, yeah, and it, oh yeah, that's what I was going to uh, uh, parallel is that at the same time you have the school of Shem on Mount Zion, you have Nimrod building the Tower of Babel. Okay, they were contemporaries of each other, and so the question is being poised: if Shem is hanging out on Mount Zion, he's got an entryway to paradise to heaven. Uh, he is teaching the Torah the way. But if Nimrod really wanted to go to heaven, why not just go to Shem? He knew who Shem was. Why not just go? According to the Epic of Gilgamesh, um, uh, Gilgamesh, who many think is Nimrod, he goes to the mountain where Noah lives, which would have been Mount Zion, and he talks to him and he interviews him. So we know that they talk. And th that just goes back to the fact that it, Nimrod didn't want to go to heaven by Yahuwah's instructions of righteousness. He wanted to take the back door. He wanted to go by his own terms. And he wanted to break through. And that shows his true wickedness. He had the full access. He could have, he could have just done it. Same thing with Esau. Esau, he never went to the school of Shem. He purpose like and Esau is the guy, keep in mind, we'll get to it. I talked about it a few weeks ago that he is contrasted with Cain, where Yaakov, uh, Esau tells Yaakov, there is no heaven, there is no afterlife, there is no Elohim. Like he just throws it out there. He didn't believe. He was a, almost like an atheist like Cain. And he never went to the school of Shem. So that's my rant, but we'll talk more about that in the weeks to come. Oh, what do you think of what I put in the chat that the school of Shem could be the camp? Like, uh, 
because Yeshua is a Melchizedek priest and he's training other priests. We're supposed to be priests in the kingdom, learning righteousness, Torah be on our heart. I've done a word study in that city and people assume it's the New Jerusalem that are, you know, that believe it comes out at the beginning. I can't prove it. And so what if that's the school of Shem? I don't know. What do you think about that? You mean the New Jerusalem is, um, mm. is the school of Shem? No, the, uh, the camp before the New Jerusalem comes yeah. down in Revelation 20. And since he's a Melchizedek priesthood and he's training priests, you know, we're all priests in the kingdom. We'll judge the other 12 tribes. What if it's, what if that's the school of Shem? I don't know. Just a thought. Yeah, I, yeah, that's, yeah, I don't, don't have a problem with that. University of Melchizedek, yeah. <laughs> you, so Josh said, <laughs> he said, maybe we are the giants and the chickens are the ancient dinosaurs. As soon as he said that, I thought of that Keanu Reeves meme. You know, where he's like, he's like, he's always thinking like, what if, you know, I like, if you have Keanu Reeves saying that, that would be pretty funny. Maybe I'll make that into a meme before the night's over. Did anyone have anything on uh, Romans that they wanted to bring up? So you talked about earlier about uh, the fathers, you know, the, the children not seeing their father's nakedness. And is it your belief then that the um, that it's OK? Uh, well, someone would have to, I guess, show a passage in scripture where because it, Moses specifies he's like. You are not to see your father's, you know, uh, the your father's nakedness, and then it says, and this is, you know, your father's uh, wife. You know, you are not to see her nakedness. Um, so, I, I, I have not present been presented with a case that would show that it is a sin if I were to see my dad naked. Like, no, like if, if he were to go swimming in a river and take it off and I were to go swimming with him. Um, you know, that's, that's a little bit outside of my culture. You know, it, it, I feel a little uncomfortable even saying that cause I, I guys, I've never seen my dad naked. So, you know, but, but I, I don't know. I don't think that that would be sin. I don't think that'd be grounds of transgressing the Torah uh, to do that. Uh, even, you know, brothers, if they were to go swimming naked or whatever, get in the shower and bathe together. I mean, the assumption here is that, it's not sexual. It's not perverse. Um, you're, you're, you're in this case, um, you're, you're, it's kind of like, okay, the, the wife is your father's, right? It's his wife. You will not lust after another man's, uh, his ox, his wife, his house, his, all these kind of things. But you are kind of a part of your father, I guess, you know, you're in his household. And it's and another example of this would be like in the, in the Middle East, uh, to this day, uh, even really before the 1800s, like pre-mud flood, guys, a, a woman's hair was exclusively reserved for her husband. Now, you can, you can debate whether that's Torah or not, but a woman would not let her hair down in the presence of anyone who was not her husband or her children. Um, and it, it would be a very sexual thing to do in a lot of cultures. And so if you are in the household, uh, is it a sin for the children to see their mother's hair? No, it's not like not in that context. You see what I'm saying? Like there are, there are things that when you're in a household that you know, you can, um, you can kind of air it out a little bit better. Another good well, example of that. Go ahead. I mean, I, I just want to say that's a little different from someone's nakedness, I would say. But here's the thing: nakedness can be seen unintentionally. Like I could, like you could wander around. You could like think that no one's in the bathroom. Walk into the bathroom, see somebody naked. You could, you know, someone could be changing. You could open the door by mistake, see somebody naked. Whereas, like this is, the difference is that it's involuntary or it's voluntary. And it seems like this is a very, right. this is a very voluntary act. And he was even boasting about it. He wasn't like, oh hey, I saw your mom naked. It's like. 
guys, check this out. Like, I really did this thing, and he's like boasting about it. So it's not just like a, oh, I just happened to walk around the corner, and there was your mom showering. Um, it was. It seems a lot more like an active thing, and that's like there's not a lot of. I don't correct me if I'm wrong, no, but I don't think there's a lot of tour that involves like just by mistakenly stumbling upon something. It's it's really willful actions that's against the law. Yeah, I think it goes even beyond uh, voluntary or involuntary and goes to intentional. Yeah, and again, though, I, I would have to see scripture passages of like... Now... When you get into the book of Maccabees, that's kind of interesting because one of the things that was considered a – when the Greeks came in and they made Jerusalem their their base, their, you know, they, they Hellenized it, one of the complaints in the book of Maccabees is that they put the gyms in – the gymnasiums in Jerusalem, and that was like an abomination. But you have to realize that you know the Greeks, they would – perform their athletics naked and it was a very public act you know that, that you're, you you're you know doing the trampoline or just you know whatever the bars whatever you're you're naked and you're you're running on the track i don't even know how that's comfortable uh for any guy but you're naked and so that would have been a breaking of the tour we're not talking about a public display of nakedness um we're talking about you know just living life type of things type of nakedness um uh, a good example might be uh, bathrooms back then. Uh, nowadays, you go into a bathroom, you have probably a private stall, like you're you're going to sit down, and that's not likely. Some cultures still are open. You go to some cultures around the world, and they don't have stalls. They just you sit down, you squat, and a guy comes and squats right next to you. I don't think that that is what is seeing somebody's nakedness in this case, right? It's in in all the cases that I can see in Leviticus, it's all sexual. Right, so if there was a if there was a uh, a very perverse boy who wanted to sexually see his father naked, and he's going and checking him out, that's obviously crossing some boundaries. That is now perverse. He he in his heart he wants to, you know, lay with another man. Um, it, that would take it to you know the, the breaking the spiritual Torah uh, in that sense. But um, no, I don't think that within a family household. I mean, think about this, Andrew. Like right now, I have a daughter who was breastfeeding right now before that i had two sons they stopped when they were two but they were there wasn't a sin for them to see their mother's breast right to 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 feed off of it so um that's just yeah i think it's all intense i think it's um now it, it's very different if i went to somebody else's house and you know and um you know i don't know i don't know i don't know if i'm a guest at someone's house how that works yeah, but as Josh says, intent that leads to, it leads to action. Yeah. Well, if we Not take mother or father, so. Well, okay. Let me let me let me give, give you another uh, example. Here in the city of Charleston, um, when I gave a tour here and showed it to be a a pre uh, or a pre mud flood city, and one of the characteristics of Charleston is that there's uh there's these side porches. There's actually two front doors. There's the front door on the street level that leads to the side, uh, the uh, breezeway. And then there's another front door. And in the history of Charleston, uh, if you, if that front door is open on the street, they're saying you're welcome to come in to the, the pri the balcony area and that we're not lounging around naked or in our undies. Um, if it's closed, you know, the family is, I, I just think that in, in older times, families were much more like, we're, we're much more weird about it here in the West. Let's put it that way. You go to these other cultures in the East and stuff like that. Like when you're in the privacy of the home, they kind of let it out a little bit more. Uh, but they're, it's because they're all, you know, family and that kind of stuff. I don't know if I'm making a point to everyone, but uh, there, there's just things that you would see in the privacy of a home if you were family that you would never see elsewhere in the cover, elsewhere. Like nowadays, you know, uh, men and women they just strut their stuff, and, you know, bikinis everywhere and that kind of stuff. And they, and it, it's that that the West is, and then we become very weird about this kind of stuff. And it's just not like that in other cultures where they're very reserved in public, and then in private they kind of let it out. All right. Yeah. Someone said next topic, please. Um, 
we can talk about something else. Did anyone have any other thoughts? I mean, I again, think... if somebody, oh. but if someone, if someone wants to make a case that uh, you were a, a man is not to see another man naked, I, I don't, I don't see that. It's like, well, then we can't have doctors, you know, we can't have. Well, not another man, but your father, or you know. Yeah, but I, I think that's ridiculous. Mother. I think you're really you're splitting hairs. Uh, I mean, it, it's a shame that they didn't do a better interpretation of this because I mean to me it's obvious you just don't see your father's wife period whether she is your mother or not makes no difference it's your father's wife she belongs to him and you're not supposed to see her naked or definitely not have any sexual relations with her it was premeditated on the part of ham because it's very clear that he basically bragged about it so I just don't see what the debate is. It seems very, very clear to me, and that's why I said, please, next topic. I mean, it, it's it's not clear. specifically you know, about Ham. I'm talking about Torah in general. Well, it's um, same thing. Not I mean, it, see it, the it, it, yeah, it, it's gonna, it's it relates. I mean, it relates to that. It's simple. Well, so what, one of the things when we talk about commands in Torah, okay. It's um, like today in Deuteronomy in our Torah portions, we're reading about uh, what idolatry is. And so uh, another great example would be like uh, the cutting the sides of your beard. And so when we when we come into the Torah communities, uh, we get we get two camps of people. All right. We're like the one camp is like you don't ever take scissors to your beard. It grows. You don't ever touch it. And then you get the others are like, no, if you look at the context, it's talking about, um, you know, cutting it for the dead or different things like that, you know, or worshiping these gods. Um, and so it, 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 another great one is uh, idolatry, uh, um, idols, obviously. And so the it's put forward. Well, it says don't have any, you know, carved image of anything in, in the heavens or, or below. And it's like, well, I mean, should we not have it, it, these are good questions asked, by the way. Are GI Joes for our sons? Is that idolatry? Right? Is you know, there's the the thing that comes up often is the the carved owl that was in my, in my house that uh, has been kind of a laughing stock in this group. Uh, but is that you know, is that an idol? These kind of things. And then, so some people will say anything that is carved, any kind of image, you can't have it at all whatsoever. Better not be in the house. And then um, some people go so far as to say you can't have uh, artwork or anything like that, right? But then the other the other camp will say, well, if you actually look at the context, because Israel did have carved images, including the temple, they were to make angels and the seraphim. It's it's about uh, worship. You are not to make any image to worship it as your god. And so when we look at all these things, we have to understand like what is he. Um, what is Moses actually saying here, right? So he could be saying that you are not to see the actual nakedness of your father. But then he does explain it and say, which is your mother. So to me, it's just context, context, context. And everybody's got to follow their own consciousness, uh, of their own, um, yeah, their own conscious on this. And I, I, I can't be the one to tell you uh, what you should or shouldn't do on this. Everyone needs to read the Bible for themselves and come up with the the right um, solution. So I was going to say something, and then, oh, yeah, uh, women covering their hair. I thought this was kind of an interesting topic, and this is probably a go-nowhere topic as well because you know, people are just divided on it. Just so you guys know, I don't have an opinion on it. Uh, Sarah does not cover her head, so this isn't like, you know, I don't enforce this on my wife. I leave it to her discretion how she feels on this. If she feels that she's supposed to cover her head, then I would support it in this case. Um, but um, I the, the conversation here by Mary that um, that uh, I thought this was interesting. She said, this is something I've wondered about. I also don't see it in Torah uh, about women having to cover the, her hair. I, I don't see either, just so we all uh, understand. Uh, but I do see that historically it was done. My family is Middle Eastern, and I know women cover their hair, but it is mainly in the Islam religion, not Christian in current days. That may be so, but when I would travel through the Middle East, I was really taken back that most women I that I would see in the middle in the uh, not just the Middle East, the uh, the Mediterranean, 
think of like the Greek Orthodoxy, uh, Russian Orthodox Church, man, they were covering their heads. In fact, a lot of these churches I would go to, to this day, they still have women and men separate. And they go to the opposite ends. Women separate, uh, w- women worship on one end and men worship on the other. So I just wanted to point out that, see, here in the West, we have, uh, we're raised, you know, obviously very American, duh, you know, and uh, surrounded by Hollywood and all these ideas. And so some of these things are very weird to us, you know, but you go to these other cultures and um, it's just very, very different uh, how they how they go about doing this stuff. Hey, no, this is Marianne. I, I will add about the head covering. Um, y- you're right about the Orthodox. I was raised Aramaic Orthodox or actually Syrian Orthodox, which is similar to Aramaic. But um, in the churches, it's funny because sometimes we go up we used to, well, I don't go to the church anymore, but we used to go up to the altar to receive communion and there would be like the elderly women giving head coverings. And so you would have to cover your head as walking up. So it is something I've always wondered about because, and, and yeah, we, we are here now. I'm first generation born here, but, um, you know, my family, um, that was in the middle East, even still, they don't cover maybe inside the church they did. But I, this is one of the things that I wonder, I see a disconnect between like ancient days and now and looking into like all of the millennial kingdom stuff. I just kind of wonder if there's some kind of like disconnect after that, like, was there some kind of disconnect after with all the deception, you know, that there's just something that we're missing that they, everybody knew back then was maybe common knowledge, but now as the times go on and we're more in this age of deception, is there something that we're just kind of missing contextually? Because even if you look back, um, uh, and I can't remember, I'm not really good with years, but like you'll see women were, had their, it was more common to be covered um, with their head, whether it was like a fancy hat or something, but coming up to now, it's just not commonly done. So it's interesting. It's just, you know, my, my thoughts and observations, but I've wondered about that. Uh, well, I, f- I fully agree with what you're saying, that there is a missing information from the past, um, and I, I don't doubt that for a second. Now, I'm not coming down. Just so, so all the women out there listening, I am not I, – I made this clear. I, have, I am not judging any woman who makes any, either decision, all right? But one of the historical realities is that if you just go 120 years back, you go to the 1800s. We're talking post-mud flood. You look at women, they covered their heads. They tied their hair up. Like, you know, they let your hair down, you would be a prostitute. 100 years ago, you, you wear your hair down, you're a prostitute. Um, and the, it was the World War II generation, really, that started getting uh, really, like, you know, crazy with their hair and stuff like that. And, um, and you know, it's, it's funny. It's like, so you look at, like, the 1890s. They still had the big dresses, you know, the women, and they covered their hair and their heads uh, with a hat or something. And, you know, what started happening? They started letting their hair down and started showing some ankles. And then all of a sudden, we're at the French bikini, baby. It just, boom, it just, you get, you take it an inch and you go, you know, a mile and it's just, everything falls apart. So, um, and I'm just showing some observations out there. I'm not like condemning anyone. I'm just saying, this is, this is kind of how it happened. This is, you know, how it works. And, um, but I think it just it helps to put in some perspective when we're having this discussion that all of human history would have looked at us, you know, getting so uptight about, you know, like, you got to what are you saying? I got to cover, you know, my hair. It's like they would have gone like, what are you? A, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to say this, but they would have been like, are you a prostitute? Like it just that historically, that's what it was. You know, you let down your hair and a guy's like, Ooh, she's loose. Maybe I can, you know, she's looking for something. So, um, again, that's just the reality of history. Um, and yeah, I, yeah. So I, I can I really, change the I subject. Really well, I, I, yeah, I keep putting my foot in my mouth. I'll let you change the subject, but I'll, I'll say this. One thing I really do appreciate about my wife is that, um, I have watched her, um, you know, in the, the 20 something years we've been married where uh, she, like when we go swimming and stuff, I really appreciate that she, um, I've never been someone who just enforces things on her. Like, you can't go to the house unless you do this or that. You know, I, I've always tried to just kind of guide her spiritually and, and show her what I'm learning and stuff like that. And and it's it's really neat to see her cover up out in public and, you know, not show things off. And, um, and I just, I appreciate about that. I see a very, you know, godly woman in her and, 
and how she acts publicly. And so just want to commend that. But anyways, go ahead, Josh. Yeah. Just, just to, just to uh, touch on that subject as a, as a, like a man who's like seeking for that. It's a, it's, it's a perfect red flag when you see a profile of someone like online or something like that. And they just have like lots of bikini pictures and you're just like, wow, you hire completely, you like don't care about other people lusting after you. It's a, it's, I would say a fairly good indicator of, um, yeah, what you said about your own wife, which is what you would respect in a wife. You're like, well, would I want my wife showing that kind of stuff online? Um, <clears throat> so to go get away from that subject, actually, I had a, kind of a question. I know people, we may have ex mil or, or military members in the group or listening, but um, nine five and nine six kind of talk about like. Um, like shedding the blood or, or killing, like shedding the blood of your brother and th- this kind of stuff. And I, I'm wondering, did, did you or Michael get into anything about like how that fits into what happens after, like, you know, where Yah commands his people to go, Oh, go and kill those, go and kill those. Um, are they not considered brothers or like, is it, is there a, like, is there some kind of like exception to the rule because it seems like almost like you shouldn't kill people who are in the camp or who are who are you know part of the tribe. But outside of that, it's like yeah, that's that's fine. Especially if you're commanded to, it's definitely okay. But it it just doesn't seem like there's a very clear line as like well, yeah, don't don't kill your brother, <laughs> um, but also you know don't kill random person trying to kill you uh, across that you know line or over on the other side of no man's land um so if you guys had comments or thoughts about that i think that would be that'd be cool well my comment on that and it just so you guys know i mean I, i'm happy for other people to talk i don't want to just take up the time and what you asked is a very good question this is one of those things that is put out there that bothers a lot of people because the the 10 words actually say do not kill it doesn't say don't do not murder it says do not kill and what I think that Josh just got at, maybe purposely or inadvertently, is pretty spot on. My, if I could sum this up in my understanding, is that um, you are not to to kill. Well, it does say that they're created in the image of Yah. Okay, not to kill. You know that that's what makes killing so wrong. So that would imply non-covenant members. But there is a distinction within Scripture that, like, if people are covenant breakers, we're talking adultery. Um, you know, these kind of things that, or very perverse sexual acts, uh, they are to be put down. They are, you are to kill them. Um, and so I, I would say that the, that seems to be, so like when he's bringing them into Canaan, he tells them to kill the inhabitants and, you know, people will say, well, this is a, uh, you know, this is a genocide, all this kind of stuff. Well, it's, the fact is, is that they were, this is where we kind of touch on this a little bit tonight, the Canaan, Canaan, you know, Ham's son, Canaan, through incest, is is now running this, this place that is trying to steal the inheritance from the Most High. They're there as Satan's seed to, to block Satan's inheritance, I mean, not Satan, you know, who was inheritance, and so they're commanded to go wipe them out. They are clearly not in the covenant. And um, and so I would I would think that that would be a, a good indicator of that uh, for Yah's people that uh, like for example we were having this discussion earlier today in the Discord group about uh, guns and you know should we shoot people in self defense and this kind of stuff and how does that work out with uh, with martyr martyrdom and you know is martyrdom what we should aspire for or not um, or persecution and so on and so forth. And, you know, everyone has different opinions on this. But the fact of the matter is, is that the saints, um, you know, go marching in, right? They they uh, they follow the Yahusha in the, the clouds of glory, tens of thousands of his saints, and they come in and they execute judgment and they take out the bad guys. So there is clear um, reason to, to end life kill if it is... Um, if they are, you know, covenant breakers at this point. There, there's a lot of covenant breakers out there. Then. Yeah, no, there are. Um, th- so in the context of the land, all right, if you are, if you are living in the land, 
Um, and there are people, this, this can guys go into eternity too, right? We, and I know Rob has brought this up in the past and asked a question in eternity. Are people still allowed to rebel and sin? I hope I never do, but that's the question. What if that is still a possibility? Their fate is going to be known. Like they're going to be removed from the land or they might be put down. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's just a, that's just a reality, right? Uh, adultery is one of the death penalties. It leads, it leads to death. So, but just in describing the, the cutoff, obviously, um, it, it says that with, within Torah that people kill others because there is hatred in their heart. And so that seems to be the other defining thing as well. Um, I was just reading that recently. I think it was at the end of um, the end of Numbers, and it it talked about if there is no hatred in someone's heart and they kill someone, they're okay. And so one of the ways it defines that is if um, if there is um, uh, like you know maybe you're, you're you have an axe, you're cutting down a tree, and the the axe slips and it hits someone in the head, right? You didn't mean to kill them. But if, if you guys were to think about this in, in terms of capital punishment, like does anybody here actually want to have to kill someone? No, I don't. I would, it would grieve my heart if I had to be a part of something where I actually had to take a life. Like somebody sinned a terrible sin um, and they have to be put down. Maybe they murdered someone and now this person has to be put down and I have to be a part of the execution party. I'm, I'm in Israel stuff. Man, that would grieve my heart. I would hate to be a part of something like that. Um, and so that seemed to be the defining factor of, of, of killing slash murder versus just killing. Man, I'm on the hot seat tonight. Hopefully I'm... I'm a... Cyber, you keep unmuting your mic. Did you have something you want to say? Yeah, um, we brought up nakedness, and I was curious on the concept of the reverse, the uh, clothing. Um, I'm working on a game mechanic, and uh, I was thinking about uh, medieval times and the clothes they used to wear, the textiles, the, uh, the silk and the cloth and um, cotton, wool and whatnot, and how appropriate that would be versus nowadays. And then having natural dyes versus synthetic dyes, um, obviously under the context of incorporating into a game, that's a side note. Um, but how applicable is that nowadays? Not so much that it's like necessary to be kosher, but like it really got me thinking, wow, I really want to like utilize like pure clothes and dyes rather than the synthetics. Uh, just out of love, just the whole nature of the, the kosher environment to me is all out of love itself. So I'm curious uh, how we think about that and if anybody has any good sources. So, no, of course. A question was asked about uh, the beard and the hair. I mean, does the Torah actually say that we have to grow a beard? Because I can't stand it. <laughs> I mean, I keep my head and my face shaved uh, always because I just can't stand hair because it's just too hot. Yeah, so there, there's a lot of people in Torah that shave their face. And you know, the, the popular image is that, you know, you grow your, your beard out. And uh, it's just think about it. like Rob Skiba shaved, uh, Zin Garcia shaves, my friend Chris Bailey shaves. Uh, he runs a big ministry. Um, and now I, I've had a beard ever since coming to Torah, but I do shave it. Like I, I keep it trim. I don't, you know, there's been a couple of times where I let it grow way out, like down to my chest. But then, you know, I keep it, pretty, but then I shave and keep it pretty trim. Now, according to many in the Torah, I'm sinning for doing that. Now, to, ask, to answer, I was just thinking about this today because it says, it never says you have to grow a beard. But then there's the command that you are to not shave the corners of your beard. So by, by that, it would be like, it's, uh, you could say, well, see, you're supposed to grow a beard, right? Now, my, my understanding, this is kind of going back to what we we're talking about earlier tonight, is that my understanding of that passage is that what Yah does not want from us is to, um, to honor the other gods uh, through our hairstyle. And um, to to not worship the dead, all right? And I think uh, really, because a lot of us would go like, what do you mean worshiping the dead or honoring the dead or whatever? But uh, maybe a better example would be uh, worshiping the gods. 
And throughout history, you look at different popular hairstyles in history, and they would honor the different gods. And what you, Yahuwah wants is us, obviously, to be a distinct people um, that doesn't do that. So, you know, then that that is kind of circular because it comes back in and go, well, you know, I don't know. Like, is uh, who was it in here earlier? Bob, he was asking earlier this week, and he's like, if I give a, he's asking a genuine question. He's like, if I uh, give a like a bowl cut to my son, is that like honoring Mercury or something like that? And I, See, those are all good questions to ask, um, but I, I don't, I don't, I don't believe that what Yah is actually asking is that you're to just let your hair. You know, you're supposed to shave the top of your head like marine cut, and you're supposed to grow your beard out. And I've had Torah guys come to my house, and they would explain that, uh, you know, the women better grow their pits out and their legs out, and the men better grow those beards out because everything else is just uh, vanity, and you just l must love yourself. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me! Like, 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 Yah is not asking us to be slobs. Like, like, he's not asking us to be like, like a hairy people. When he says to be peculiar people, he doesn't say be hairy people. Um, but again, this comes to each one of you. Each one of you needs to read that and come to your own conclusions. I, for one, feel that it is okay to grow my hair long on top or take scissors to it. Um, that that is not uh, what he's getting after. So, Yeah, that would that would kind of nullify the Nazarene vow, wouldn't it? Uh, isn't that just shaving everything? I mean, shave your head, shave your beard to do the Nazarite vow. And uh, also, it could be something about goatees, you know, shaping your beard into some pointy looking thing. So either you don't have a beard or you do have a beard and you just keep it trimmed. I was going to, um, I kind of mentioned it in the chat about, you know, the Native Americans and finding out that their hair, your hair is like an antenna, right? And it's connected right to your, your head, your brain. And so I would say for the men too, you know, the men were the ones that went out into nature and did stuff more and having hair on your face is you're going to be more sensitive to the things around you. So I don't think there's anything, and I know when I deep dove into studying this out that it, the literal from the Hebrew seems to mean you shouldn't pull out your you shouldn't mar your beard which means you don't pull it out by the root because they would do that in like like you're saying these pagan rituals where they would you know they rip their garments they pull their beard out to show their you know sadness or whatever or their anxiety and so i think this idea of how you see the hasidic jews they grow out their sideburns and those tendrils you know i think um and, and again, so there's a misunderstanding even in 1 Corinthians 11 about them, you know, people say it says that men shouldn't have long hair. Well, it doesn't say that. If you go back into the root word, it really points to this idea of men having like tended hair, tended tresses or coiffed or styled, right? So if men are spending all this time, you know, getting perms or die or they're cutting it in certain ways and they're having to spend all this time with the gel I and mean, to me that's because the reason is because you appear feminine and so in some cultures you know i think at the time it was translated this long hair because at the time long hair was equated with femininity but the next verse goes on to say and some people misinterpret that where it says for the woman her hair is given her as a covering well that word is not the same word where the word covering is used throughout the rest of the scripture it's more like um is given to her as a, a a vesture or a mantle so like if you think of a priest has a certain vesture a, a, a judge has a certain vesture it identifies them right you see a judge in a robe that's a judge you see a priest in a frock that's a priest right so you see a woman you see a person with long hair that's a woman you know that's that's the or actually again it's not just long hair it's tended hair styled hair um it's it's a it, her hair is given to her as part of her fem, feminine identity and so you know she's allowed to you know even though it says we shouldn't as as believers we shouldn't be drawing attention to ourselves with a bunch of crazy braids and jewels and all that stuff but it is part of a womanly feminine thing to beautify yourself and to you know and your hair is part of part of your ornamentation. That being said, it also says that um, a woman's hair is her glory. And First Corinthians twenty nine says, "No flesh shall glory before Yah." So if we have the people want want, and I 
trust me, I struggled with all of this as I searched it out, studied it, and I've come as as soon as I kind of went in one direction in faith, he starts confirming stuff. He starts getting your answers. And so if you really think about the priesthood was called, they had a uniform that they wore, and it was to protect them from the energy of the um, the ark that they were going to encounter. And also, you know, they were the priests, they're slaughtering animals. There's lots of energy things going on there. And so they covered their heads, they covered, they wore linen. All this is an energy thing. So now we are the priesthood. And so it says that woman is the glory of man, right? And man is the glory of Yahusha. So, and the hair is the glory of the woman. So when we present ourselves in the assembly, we want to be the glory of Yahusha. We should be presenting ourselves as one echad priest, priesthood. So the woman covers her glory in her hair. She is also kind of hidden in her, if she's married, you know, this is why lots of, lots of times if you really read it, it says veiled. Like you're not just supposed to just cover your hair. You're supposed to cover yourself <laughs> in a sense. This is why, you know, you've got these cultures with all the burkas and all this stuff because they, you know, they go to the extreme. But in the assembly, it's really, we're supposed to, it's, it's symbolic of presenting ourselves, putting ourselves in the right authority, um, presenting ourselves as an echad priesthood that is a glory, is the glory of Yahusha. One, one whole new man as the priests before him. That's what I've gotten from it, and among other things. Sounds like you nailed it pretty good to me. I'm in agreement. Uh, recently, um, I, I was uh, looking at some kind of a job, and like they were like, "Okay, as long as you shave your beard to like a half inch." And I was like thinking about it. Hmm, so now I got to think more about it, you know. Recently, because it just comes up out of sight, out of mind. And like, okay, so I'm at the point where I could do that, you know. I I understand, you know. I got peace about it. But I'm like, I just don't want to. <laughs> it's it's perfectly fine just that way too. Um, but yeah, the uh. I, I like how the, it was mentioned about the Na Native American and, and feeling more in tune spiritually. And that really did take a big um, part of my decision not to. And it's like, I don't really need the job. Money's a little tight, um, but I really want to be connected. Um, so that, that's, I don't know, that was just where I went with it. Live action experience there. Um, yeah. I, I, got a, I got a quick question, Noel. Um and this is back to Romans. So you mentioned at the end of the chat that we're kind of waiting on whether or not Paul is pro or against circumcision. Is So what we've kind of figured out up until this point is that Paul is certainly pro-Torah. He's advocating for Torah. He's advocating for Torah obedience. But you're saying that the, like the kind of the final kind of like nail in the coffin to put that to bed is if he's pro or against circumcision and if he's against it then he's really there's something else at work here so are you saying that like our quote-unquote judgment of paul or like our, our final kind of like hey this whole paul thing of course there are other scriptures there are other um letters and stuff like that that you know may or may not be attributed to paul or, or may or may not be written by him but that you know we're still kind of waiting for that final kind of like circumcision is like the big one is he gonna is he gonna pass this test or is he gonna not and if not then you know i guess we'll have to figure out what happens then right okay yeah so the point the point i was making is that all right so you come over to camp torah and um what what but people in torah fail to recognize i have pointed this out so many times that the most scandalous thing the most controversial thing is that they obey Torah. Like to the rest of the world, when we climb out of this bubble that we live in on the internet, the rest of the world, they're like, that's pretty scandalous, dude. Like, w what's up with that, right? Paul, but then in Torah, when you start questioning Paul, pe you know, people in the Torah, they start freaking out and all this kind of stuff. And so many of the people I've talked to, they're like, no, no, he, you know, I, I get this all the time. No, he, he did keep Torah. How, you know, how dare you insinuate that he's not? And, you know, any true, you know, follower of Messiah would know that. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. And then you start talking to them and they're like, yeah, he did away with circumcision. I'm like, what? 
what <laughs> what do you mean then he didn't then he didn't keep torah like okay so right now uh i am reading commentary by a very uh interesting uh torah guy who um again he he says oh paul kept torah he kept torah he advocated torah but he did away with circumcision i'm like hello you know you just want it like hello you know like like biff like hello butthead whatever like you just want to knock him on the head with your knuckles because it's like it, it, as james makes clear you break one one law tour you break the whole thing you can't it, or as i point out with yahusha right that you you break one of the least of the commands and tell others to do the same you will be the least in the kingdom paul is not exempt okay so my point is is that I feel that in Acts, I made the case that according to the narrative of the book of Acts, that what Luke is saying is that all these accusations that, that Paul um, did away with the Torah or the laws or the traditions of Moses, at the, the core of which was circumcision, that he told people not to circumcise, he said all that is their false rumors, it's not real. It's false testimony, right? And so I'm content with that. In the book of Romans, and I think I'm making the case uh, very solid, at least content to my mind, that the whole worldview, Paul's entire worldview was the Torah. In fact, one of the things they will not tell you in churches, pastors, is that it is well debated among scholars that one of the determining factors of whether or not a, a letter is legitimate by Paul or not is his level of discussing Torah. It's it's it, He doesn't need to sign it. It doesn't need to say an epistle by Paul. It's kind of like how you can tell a Van Gogh from a Monet, right? Monet never signed his paintings. Van Gogh never signed his paintings. Uh, you know, uh, Leonardo da Vinci never signed his work. We know it's their work because it's their it's their their style, like their their you know their their hand strokes. That we just know, right? And one of Paul's obsessions is talking about the Torah. Um, and so I have, I am concluded in my mind that the book of Romans makes absolutely no sense. It has no moral standing if the Torah is not in his worldview. He places it as the highest uh, moral authority. Uh, it's very clear. It, he argues for it. It's, he's not arguing against it. The question is, is that people will still say, but, but circumcision, right? I mean, and so I, I stated tonight that um uh I, I directed us back to acts that if uh if luke is correct then he is not arguing against circumcision sometimes it really looks like he is though um and that's really what it comes down to um if if people have to make up their own minds on that it's no sweat off my back if someone says i don't follow paul because he did away with circumcision i'm like okay i mean i i, I won't disagree with that i i'm not going to get into it i'm not going to give into a um I have fear when it comes to Yahushua's words that I'm not going to teach against the law, um, at least not my understanding of it. Um, you know, we got into this discussion about hair and stuff like that tonight, and I, that's why I, I try to tell everyone, look, you need to read this for yourself and come to your conclusions. This is my understanding of it, right? Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but... Um, so uh, just, to, just to kind of continue on that, Noel, is it, is it then possible that, you know, Paul is is pro Torah, but he's he's anti circumcision, and in that way, like because it says like anybody who who like violates this but and teaches others to do so, the least of these, well, I don't think circumcision is necessarily the least, but it doesn't say that they're not going to be part of the kingdom. It just says they'll be considered least. So is it possible right. that maybe Paul is mistaken, was mistaken on circumcision, or was kind of catering to the people he was writing to, and therefore is considered least? And in that way, we just have to say, hey, you know what? He was wrong about this, and Torah and all, all of Scripture and other covenants invalidate what he's what he's claiming about circumcision. Well, yeah. So my answer, my answer is twofold. Okay, it's twofold. Um, if he is saying that, then he is wrong. Paul is wrong. Yes, he's wrong. Because uh, it, it, like, like I pointed out tonight, the, the instructions are very clear. And Torah never says, nor do any prophets in the Tanakh uh, say, nor does Yahushua say, oh, by the way, uh, somewhere down the line, this guy is going to come along. He's going to write a letter and just listen to what he says. He's going to do away with his command. And it's all, it's all good. It's all good. You know, that, that never says that, right? Um, however, on the other hand is I'm kind of giving him – the benefit of the doubt you know and um this has been seen as a big act of betrayal by law the anti-paul crowd 
Um, I think that it's been very helpful for me to be on both sides of the argument, to see the pro-Paul argument, to be on that at one point, and then be on the anti-Paul argument, and really see both ends, and to believe both ends, uh, and to really search these things out. And I could see how all the different arguments work. Now, I'm, I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt, because what I, as I think I was tr really trying to hammer over and over and over again over the last four weeks, is that when he was... Um, he was speaking to a crowd where he was where oh man, I phrased this so many times. The Yahoo Dean, he made the case that Yahoo Dean didn't even believe in Elohim to begin with. They believed in them, they believed in themselves. They believed that they that Elohim owed them something, that they deserved to go to heaven. It was the same way with the Husha. They felt the same way. And you know, he called them the sons of Satan, right? Um, and so they're extremely jealous of seeing all these um, goyim come flocking into the covenant. And one thing that makes them jealous is that they're not the ones doing it. It's not by their power. It's by Elohim's power. They hate this. The Yahudim, they hate this. And they're like, they're, they're turning their noses up in them. They're like, you're not righteous. You guys are sinners. Look at you. You look at you. You, you, you don't get the, the law like we do. We're morally superior than you. You guys are nothings, right? And so Paul is coming to, as an advocate going like, I got guys over here. Yeah, they're not circumcised, but they keep the law. They, they actually believe in Elohim, and they keep the Torah way more than you guys do. And I think that that's really the argument here. I think that um, when you study Acts 15, which is what Romans is going off of, is it's Yaakov's words. Um, you have the 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 Pharisees there, by the way, the believing Pharisees, and they're straight out saying you've got to be circumcised. Peter and Yaakov, they never disagree with that. They're like, yeah, well, they need to be circumcised. But they agree on the four things. You know, I think it's four things like, you know, don't, you know, the blood and the different things like that. Uh, and, and then and Yaakov Strayot says, you know what? We will bring them each Sabbath to the, the tabernacles, to the, the, the synagogue, so on and so forth. And they will begin reading Moses and start reading. That's, that's what they wanted. They Because the point of the Torah is that it's supposed to show if we qualify to be covenant members, each one of us. Each one of us is tried by the Torah, and either we fall away from it, or we become Torah terrorist, or we get it right. And that's one of the things that it can't it can't be um, – and this is one of the problems when a lot of people like try to go to Torah communities, and they're like – you know, they're like – it's all about appearance and, you know, and the pressure of, of doing things a certain way, having the right kind of beard, you know, all these kind of different things, because you're pleasing man. And if you're a righteous person, you're not going to shave your beard, right? You're going to have this certain Hebrew look. And, uh, you know, your tassels a certain length and all these different things. And, and that's, I think, what Paul was against. He was like, look, they're, they're – um, they believe they have the faith of Abraham. He's already given them the Holy Spirit. Um, if they are truly um, uh, believers, if they are truly in the covenant with the Most High, that will come to fruition. We will see that in time and, you know, in mature, as they mature and grow. Um, that's one of the tensions we all have to live in, the wheat and the tares. Um, you know, he was, um, he, Paul was giving people permission to be tares, I think. I think that's what he was doing. Um, and it's it's kind of one of the things we kind of have to, you know, have to let happen. Does that make sense? That's my understanding of this. Uh, that's yeah. That's kind of where I'm at. No, I have another question. It's kind of a little bit of an aside. Maybe it's off topic. Why does Yahushua be all like, hey, man, I'm going to separate the sheep from the goats? Goats are like awesome and hilarious. And they're <laughs> – anybody who owns goats, I mean, <laughs> they're, they're silly little guys. Like they're – and they're also cool. Like they can do all kinds of stuff. Whereas sheep, you know, they just like graze and you literally have to take care of them really <laughs> a lot for them to do anything productive. And uh, goats, uh, you can do all kinds of stuff with goats and, and they'll 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 have a ton of fun and, uh, you know, they'll amuse you for, for your entire lifetime. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on, or anybody's thoughts for that matter, on, hey, what, what's with the goats and why all the hate for the goats? I mean, they're amazing. Well, if someone else wants to answer that, go ahead. But I will say quickly that there is an article on my website that a guest writer wrote. She is uh, she is goat husbandry. Um, I guess she's not a shepherd, but she raises goats husbandry. And she wrote a really good article about saying how awesome goats are. 
Uh, but then she, you know, she asked the same question: Why all the hate towards goat and goats in the Bible? Right? Like they're not evil. You know, they're actually really cool creatures. Uh, I love goats. I love their personalities myself. But you know, obviously they're identified with Satanism and um, you know Bills above and all that. But um, does anybody else have anything they want to say in the sheep and the goats? So it's not just me talking all night. Um, I just know that there's a scripture I can't think of the top of my head is um, like during, during Pesach, it said that you can bring a lamb or a goat. Like um, it's not just strictly for lambs that we can eat. Uh, but I, I'm just going to look for the scripture to just to back up what I'm saying here. Well, while, also, while, she, while she looks that up um, a couple, maybe three Passovers ago now, I can't remember. Uh, yeah. Three Passover ago. Uh, we actually had goat for Passover and we went to a, a Torah goat uh, husbandry farmer um, about 40 miles away from us, and we got a goat. It, it also might have something to do with the goat and man hybrid that the Nephilim created. Uh, I think there's a tie-in on that. Also, I, I want to comment about uh, Paul as far as the, uh, the circumcision. I think Paul was pro-circumcision for sure. If he followed Torah, which everything we've read so far says he did, he had to do that. The problem was that the Jews of the time figured that the Gentiles should automatically have to do every single thing that they did. But what they didn't understand is that the Jews had had the Torah for thousands of years. A Gentile may not have known anything whatsoever about the Torah. So basically what Paul was saying is, hey, let's don't give them all these things to do at one time. Let's do the important things first. And then later on, as they become Torah observants and their hearts are circumcised, then they will automatically do the circumcision and all the other things that the Torah calls for, just like us today. When we are following the Christianity churches of the world and we are uh, totally against the Torah and then we begin to learn the Torah, we slowly slide into that. We're not just going to automatically be 100% Torah observant and know everything because we don't know everything. And I think Paul was giving them the same benefit of the doubt to the Gentiles. And that's why he's basically called the apostle to the Gentiles is because he was slowly moving them into that Torah observance. Yeah, spot on, 100%. I agree. What, what Paul was, again, to reiterate, what Paul was doing was he was stressing that it, it, we are to please Elohim, not man. It had to be Yahuwah doing it. it, you know, working through us, not man working through us. That is his whole point. And so that we have to live in that tension of living amongst the wheat and tares. And there's going to be many people in the congregation that are the tares and many of the wheat and uh, the goat and the sheep. And that's something that we all have to uh, search our own hearts, you know, especially it, it, it gets almost hyperdrive in these um, these truther communities where it's like, you know, who's the spook and who's the agents and, you know, who's, you know, working for whom. And, you know, and we're all like trying to like look and inspect other people. And it's like, you know, it, we're always trying to wake people up and prove them wrong. And it's like, man, we need to remember that, like, this is about searching our own hearts out. And, you know, introspection. I had something else I was going to say about Paul. Oh, yeah. The other thing to point out about Paul that really has struck me through this is that if he really was leading people away from the Torah, if that was his intent, then why is he arguing with the Yahudim? Why are they arguing with him? If he is seriously just creating his own religion, they would be like, okay, fine. But they wouldn't like it, it. It was the fact that it was clearly the fact that he was bringing in all these Gentiles and they were so upset by it. Um, and you know, because they wanted their system, you know, set up. And so, um, it the fact that he's constantly arguing with him is more proof in my mind that he is keeping the Torah because he's always talking about it and saying, no, you just you guys are the ones that are misunderstanding what you're, you know, what it is. He's not speaking against the commands. He's trying to get at the heart of the issue of why they don't believe in the Torah to begin with. Um, anyways, it is, um, it's getting late tonight, guys, and I enjoyed this conversation. Um, I'll give it a few more minutes if anybody else has anything else. But other than that, I will be signing out. I just wanted to share that, that message. Um, sorry, go ahead.
I was just going to say, I, you know, I think they were jealous. Not only were they jealous, but they just thought that these Yahudim were inferior. They just n were not worthy to be on the same level as they were. Yes, absolutely. So it is, it's, um, it's actually in Exodus uh, 12, where it talks about the Passover uh, lamb, but it says in um, 12, 5, it says that your lamb shall be an unblemished male a year old, and you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. So you could eat the lamb or the goat or a goat for your Passover lamb. I think the reason why, like, there's just such a hate on, like, the goats and stuff, I think it kind of goes back to, Yom Kippur with the with the two goats where the one was let out into the wilderness and I think that that's where you know Satanists kind of take the you know is that like the the Bez Bezazel being let out into the wilderness and that the other goat um, was the one that was taken for the slaughter and I think that that's where the whole you know where Satan takes the half side of it but anyways I mean I don't think that we have any reason to hate on goats because we are allowed to eat them and and use that as a, one of our Passover lambs you could have a lamb or a goat. So uh, obviously, the the big difference between sheep and goat is pretty self evident. Like, no, goats are not evil. But if Yahusha is our shepherd, uh, a shepherd, uh, you can't really be. It's very hard uh, to be a shepherd of goats because goats, you know, they kind of go their own way and uh, they're a bit more stubborn. Where sheep are very dependent upon the shepherd. Um, my, um, I, I, I've said this before. I'll give a goat story and a sheep story. When we were going through Europe, and you would spend a month in each, you know, each place, like a month in Ireland, month in Scotland, month in you know England or Great Britain, a month in, you know, wherever, and we were going around, and we encountered a lot of commu you know, sheep. Like we would just be living on like you know these pastures with sheep and everything. And I used to love the sheep, and I would, um, and I would try to like you know tiptoe, like walk on eggshells around them because they were so fickle. And they would just look up at you, like one of them, and their ears would pop up and they'd be like, Wah! and like all of them, like a hundred of them would run away. And it's like, oh, you're just trying to walk through the woods. And it's like, oh man, we just like stampede of sheep running away because they're like, you're not my shepherd. I don't know who you are. You're a stranger, right? Stranger danger. And they just run. And that's the idea of a sheep that they're, you know, in the truther community, we call people sheep um, because, well, that's what they are. Uh, they follow the shepherd. They follow Dr. Fossey, blah, blah, blah. Uh, hopefully we are the sheep to follow Yahushua, right? Well, goats don't do that. Now, my favorite goat story was I was in Yellowstone National Park and I was back in my photographer days and I, I wanted to go capture the, the wild goats there, uh, the mountain goats, not the bighorn sheep, but the wild mountain goats. And uh, I asked the ranger like where I can find them. And they said, well, they're really hard to find. But if you, you know, it's like this, if you go on this like 10 mile hike this way up this mountain, you might find them up there. We've seen uh, reported activity up there recently. So I'm like, okay. So I chanced it. I based a whole day. I hiked up and I'm on this high mountain up in, you know, way away from people. And I could see on the other mountain, all of a sudden the mountain started moving. I'm like, oh. <gasps> It like it was like a, it looked like a like a skirt that was moving. I'm like those are the goats, and I watched as the skirt moved and it started coming up my mountain, and then all of a sudden there was one goat, then two goats, and three goats, and all of a sudden there's like a hundred goats around me, and they're surrounding me on all sides, and they started coming up and um, they started taking a fascination to me, and they started coming up to me and they started like rubbing their um, their horns on me, and and then. I'm starting to get a little afraid because uh, they started fighting for my affection and the goats started ramming each other to get the other goats away from me. And some of them started turning on me and started ramming me in the butt. And I'm like, this could go bad. Really? I was on a cliff guys. I'm like, this could go bad really fast. Um, but yeah, goats are, are obviously I'm still alive. So, you know, I didn't fall off the mountain, but I did get rammed in the butt several times and those suckers hurt. Um, uh, got it. I don't think it was like purple bruises or anything, but yeah, they had some force. But, um, yeah, that's my goat story. I love goats, they're wonderful, stubborn creatures. And in fact, um, there's a passage in Job where, uh, Yahuwah says that he takes special pride in the wild ass because he says he's untamed and that Yahuwah takes like he, like he's like, I did that, like I created that creature that, like, you know, how stubborn donkeys are and you can't pull them on the rope. I did that. That's all me. Um, so it kind of shows a little bit of Yah's character. And um, so, yeah, goats are not evil. They're just kind of, you know, 
a part of who he is and what he thinks about. So, I think the key that you just hit on there was that um, about the stubbornness of goats. And when it says that we're separating the sheep from the goats is that we're separating like the stubbornness of people who don't want to follow him and want to just live in the world and themselves. And then the sheep who do want to be shepherded right. and be followed by him. That's kind of how I would view that scripture. Yeah. Yeah. Right. There's nothing, nothing, you know, it's kind of like, like guys, like an owl, like, you know, yes, I know the Bohemian Grove uses owls and the occults and stuff, but there's nothing evil about an owl, right? Like we put these, these character traits on these animals sometimes that owls are not, you know, actually evil. I have these owls, nesting owls in our house and I go out sometimes at sunset looking for them. And they are so beautiful when I find them. And like, they'll see me and they'll like, you know, owls, they're, they're very interested in you. They'll look down with big eyes and just stare at you. And it's so haunting, uh, but yeah, beautiful creatures as well.